Lads, lads, lads. Lads, 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 welcome to the Chef United Way, another live stream. We are here with another fans forum. That's what we're going to call them. We did the last one about the season, uh, and now we're doing a so the Chris Wilder, the saga. This is, I think, where we're going to end it, really. We're going to chat about ev anything and everything in this video. Uh, I know we've done a couple of videos already, but we've got lots and lots of people ready waiting on the stream for today so without further ado i'm going to bring mr hal stewart into the stream how are you doing my friend oh, still in a bit of a whirlwind if i'm honest nick it still hasn't sunk in there's part of me that keeps waking up each morning and thinking it's a dream right and that five nil defeat to lesser that that didn't really happen we never lose by five goals to nil but then it's it's still real and it's uh it's rubbish. It's rubbish. It feels like the uh, the heart and soul of a lot of Sheffield United has been has been taken out. He isn't synonymous really with anyone else other than than Sheffield United. Chris Wilder, really, for many fans of other clubs, is Sheffield United. He is, mate. He is. Uh, not sure where we're going to go from here. Whether we're going to go up or whether we're going to go down. But um, yeah, let's hope history doesn't repeat itself because we've been in this position before. We have parted companies with. A manager straight after being relegated from the Premier League. Let's hope it doesn't go that way this time. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, shall we kick off? Yeah, we should. I think before we go any further, it's only right that we do mention Stephen Jagielka, a former Sheffield United midfielder, Shrewsbury Town footballer as well, and of course the brother of Phil Jagielka. He has tragically passed away at the age of just 43 both myself and Nick are thinking of Phil and his family at this incredibly tough time. Yeah, really, really sad, isn't it, Hal? Today when we heard the news, uh, we didn't really want to speculate because it's such a young age to lose somebody. Shockingly, shockingly young age. It is. Um, and we, we, don't wanna be, we don't want this to be a, a really sad stream because obviously... We've got other things that we need to be talking about, but we wanted to highlight it just before we started because it is really sad. We've got someone at the club who is a family member of this player as well. He's not just an ex-player. He's also a brother to Phil Jagielka. And, uh, yeah, we, we just want to send all our love to Jags and his family at this uh, really tough time. Yeah, and I think it puts a lot of things in perspective that we've all been sort of worrying about over the last uh, few days. So, absolutely, thoughts with the entire Jagielka family. Uh, today it is all about our fans forum as Nick quite rightly says and the subject is Chris Wilder who's now left his position as manager of Sheffield United. Wilder became manager of his boyhood club back in May 2016 and he led us to the Premier League in only his third season in charge. It seems absolutely incredible to say that out loud. I mean his achievements will be fully praised in this video because that's what he deserves. We've already had our say that video titled Chris Wilder Leaves Sheffield United is one to save and to watch later. But today, it's not about Nick and Hal. It's about you, the fans. How are you feeling? What are your thoughts on this situation? And looking forward, how do you see things going for the club, players, board and backroom staff? I think it's only right that I say we have been inundated with requests from fans to join this forum. And we will shortly be introducing a number of them on screen. But if you're watching live... Please put your comments in the chat and our wonderful Bobby in the background, he will share them on screen and we can discuss them. If, of course, you're watching this later, write your comments below. Nick and I read every one of them. We know people from the club in this country and overseas. I'll say no more than that. Watch this channel. We know that for a fact. So make your feelings heard. And the most important thing, and finally... Please be respectful. Let's keep it clean. And remember, we're all Blades, aren't we? Very, very good introduction there, Hal. So uh, let's just kick right into it, mate. Uh, we've got Drew Elliott coming in right now. So welcome to the stream, Drew. How are you doing today? Yeah, not bad. Thanks for having me on, guys. 
No problem at all. Really, really excited to have a new face on the channel. We've got a lot of new faces on the channel today, haven't we, Hal? Yeah, that's one of the most exciting things about the Fans Forum, and we're doing this, of course, because we can't all meet up together with the current situation of the world, so this is the closest thing we can get to, Nick, isn't it? So actually just bringing fans together and having our say. Exactly, and the last one went absolutely perfectly. Everyone came, up, came in on time. It went swimmingly. So let's hope the same for today. Oh, don't and say that. <laughs> it started very, very well anyway, because Drew is on time, well before time, and uh, you are here now. So uh, let's kick off with the first question then. So um, would this have happened if fans were still in grounds and had there been no pandemic? I don't know. It's, it's quite. It's, it's a. It's a bit of a catch twenty two question, I think, because I think if it was a normal, if it was a normal scenario. And, we'd, and this pandemic never have happened. I think the club, I, do, I definitely don't think we would have been in this position that we're in now. So I don't think the situation of Chris even being in doubt of leaving would be wouldn't be happening. Um, you know, last season we had we had all the momentum in the world. Um, you know, might sound a bit mental, but I think you know easily we could have possibly pushed for the Europa League, sixth or seventh place. Again, form team if there was no if there was no break. Um, Spurs were missing Harry Kane, Son, Manchester United were missing Rashford. So that that three or four month break, or whatever it was, you know, allowed them to get back in time, and it completely killed our momentum. So obviously, leading into this new season, you know, I just I don't think we would be bottom of the league with how many points we've got. Anyway, um, I think we would have. My realistic goal for this season was probably sixteenth, fifteenth. Um, even you know, if you know, like no. Uh, you know, obviously, fans have been back in the stadium. Um, I think that's a pretty realistic goal. Um, but you know, yeah, just I, I don't think this would have again a few. Um, sorry, I'm trying to formulate my words, but I think yeah, if under normal circumstances, I don't think this would have happened. Even if the the results were mirrored to exactly what this season was with fans in, I still I still don't think he would have left because I think we would have understood as a fan fan base. You know, yeah, okay, the results are not great. But we understand that this is, you know, showing them the love every uh, every game with the songs. The boy just knows that, you know, this is still the guy that's going to bring us back up next season. Yeah, I think that's some really good points there, and I'm I'm struggling to disagree with any of it, Drew. So, the worrying thing for a lot of Blades fans, and I want your thoughts on this, is do you see the core of the team being dismantled now? I don't want to be too pessimistic, but. Unfortunately, I do a bit. I think just history is Sheffield United fans. I think you know we're, we're very used to seeing like that kind of happen. Those best players kind of leaving. Um, as much as I'd love to say that everyone is still going to be there next season and we can have a good push, the sad thing is, what's the motivation now? You know, Chris has gone. Chris brought in all these guys. You know, you know John Egan, Jack O'Connell's been there since day dot. Flex been there since day dot. So as much as you know, they ha they understand the club and there's definitely a connection with the fans. You know. Surely some of them must be thinking, well, am I going to play under another manager? Maybe this is time to, maybe this is time to, you know, try pastures new, I suppose. But um, I think people like McGoldrick, Sharp, Norwood, maybe Baldock might still stay. Um, I know a lot of them said they want to finish their career here. Um, but I don't see people like Sander Berg. Obviously, Lundstrom's going to go. Maybe even Egan. Hopefully not. But yeah, I, th I think maybe the those guys that we love um, so dearly, I think you know, they possibly could be looking at outside the door and maybe trying somewhere else unfortunately yeah possibly so we can't say anything for certain um do you see it being now a bit of a, a culture change i know you've just mentioned um some of those players there um and are we still going to be playing three five two what what, what we're going to be doing yeah well again it's, it's another good question i mean i think culture change has always changed with depending on who that man comes in whoever that person is coming into the club. I mean, off the top of my head, you use someone like Eddie Howe. I don't think we'll be playing the same way. Um, might be a bit disrespectful to him, but I don't think, you know, the players would have that kind of die for attitude like they did for Wilder, where they just run through brick walls. You know, after the Liverpool game last season, it was like, obviously we were so proud that I was at the game um, at Bramall Lane, like so proud of them come off. We we're unlucky to draw. And Wilder, after the game, summed it up perfectly about what we're about when they were like, oh, well, whoever I was interviewing said then oh you must be proud of them today and he went well we weren't we were all right but you know putting in a shift is the minimum requirements for the club you know that that's that's the bar that's the absolute minimum so you know it, it does Eddie Howe come in or whoever comes in have that standard as, as well that I don't know so I think it just depends on who the who who comes in um and what their kind of 
philosophy is. So, I mean, potentially, yeah, there could be a bit of a culture shock, especially if it's someone that's not really, um, you know, familiar with the club. That's all, yeah, possibly. So, Drew, there's a lot of things that we realise now were probably key. Maybe this has been going on for quite a long time. I remember uh, when we played Bristol City and Chris Wilder sort of did that heartfelt, almost felt like goodbye to the fans and, and maybe there'd already been some kind of rumblings in the background there of a fallout. But do you think that no financial backing this January was actually was really key and actually was a mistake from our owners? Yeah, I mean, as a fan, I can totally understand why Wilder's frustrated because, you know, if, if the board came out and said to us, you know, as fans, listen, we're already down, doesn't matter what's going to happen, we're not going to spend any money, even though we know what this, the, the table is, fans would be like, well, that's not the attitude that we want, you know, we want to, we want to go for it. But as a financial aspect, as, as you know, say someone from the board, they go, well, listen, you know, it's not going to happen. We're not going to stay up. Let's consolidate. Let's look at next season. Let's see what we can do. And if that means bringing in better players, and especially the main thing, which is obviously I know the rumblings behind why he has walked, you know, things like the training ground, which was exciting, you know, that was to be promised that it was going to be, you know, improved upon, then, yeah, it might be the right decision. But at the moment, I just, like, again, as a fan, I just think, you know, what, no, we couldn't, we couldn't shell out for two loan players to come in and just help out with the bodies and help out with the squad. I think, I think there's poor excuse from them. But again, I can kind of understand from a business standpoint. But yeah, as a fan, it's not, not really sit well with a lot of us, I can imagine. No, it's, it's really difficult to sit there and look at all the injuries that we've got and, and kind of just give up because that's what it felt like from the board. And I felt like for, for myself that 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 kind of that was drilled home that that was that was it. It was over. Yeah. Um, and and they, they didn't really. And like you say, I understand. I really understand that uh, that's the, the as a business, they've said, right, we've not got. Uh, a, a very good chance, a really low probability of staying up. What's the point in shelling out a load of, especially for someone like Jesse Lingard, who who's, would be quite Ooh. a lot of money? Nick, yeah. you mentioned Jesse Lingard. You know, we we had heard rumours about Ben Davis and Jesse Lingard coming in in January. And, you know, we don't know for a fact that, that was ever going to happen, but you can imagine if Chris Wilder had been promised that perfect defensive replacement who's not going to get a lot of minutes at Liverpool, so it doesn't really make sense for him to go there, and also being promised that kind of live wire spark plug, someone who can get things going in the midfield, Jesse Lingard, and also a real attacking threat, which is desperately what Sheffield United need. If he was promised something like that, and then that wasn't delivered, you can imagine the kind of blow that that would have been, and that would have felt in January to have been very much like given up. OK, we're resigned to relegation. You know that Chris Wilder is not a man who will ever be resigned to relegation and is actually left without relegation on his CV. I, th I think, obviously, you know, it's, again, it's a good point that you mentioned there. Again, especially with being on loan. Like, I mean, you know, for the, for the player, I mean, it's, such, it's so low risk. I mean, OK, you go down, but it's not your mess to deal with next season. You know, if it's Jesse Lingard, you know, he goes, OK, well, I need, I need minutes. This is a team that desperately needs someone like me. I can come in, build a bit of a reputation here. And, and kick up my career. Obviously, he's went to West Ham, but he's done amazing. Which is, it, it's the story of, of of us looking for these players. They always seem to go to a different club and do well. Mo Pai, Watkins, Cash, and obviously Lingard, another one. Um, and especially for the, like you said, the lad from Preston. You know, he's not going to be playing for Liverpool. And you know, again, if it's on loan, then you know, what's the, what's you know, why why wouldn't you come? Uh, especially with someone like Wilder there. So it definitely might be the the straw that's just broke the camel's back and going. He's like, well, what's the point? If you're not going to put the FA in, then why am I coming in? You know, I'm presuming early every day, leaving the last one to leave and going, you know, what's the point? I'm, get, I'm getting lumped with these results, you know, and enough's enough. And obviously, you know, before I go, I, you know, I'm absolutely gutted that he has gone. Um, you know, I was saying to you know, a good friend of mine, it's, you know, it's been some of the best memories of my life. You know, I'm 25, so I've only really known the Warnock and, and Wilder eras and obviously the kind of dross in the middle. <laughs> so... Have we lost Drew there, Nick? Are you hearing? No, I think we've lost Drew. Oh, Drew, if you, your cable's disconnected, mate. <laughs> Unfortunately, I've got to say, though, Nick, how knowledgeable are our fans? And Drew has just epitomised that uh, with, with, with what he said. Drew, I'm so sorry, buddy. We seem to have lost your, uh, lost your mic. Uh, we can yeah. see you. We can see you, but we can't hear you, uh, Drew. Thank you so much. I'm sorry you didn't get to finish what you were going to say. I'll, I'll assume that Drew was going to say that uh, 
Hal for manager, Nick for assistant would be obviously his his preferred choice going forward. Uh, Drew, top man, thank you so much. We will have to get Drew involved in the channel again because I thought he spoke really well, Nick. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, we've got uh, a little more people as well, so we're uh, going to get on to some more. Um, we've got one of your your guys, Hal, haven't we, next? Oh, Paul Young, Paul Left Peg Young, and uh, <laughs> Paul, you've decided because you know because you know I love American sports. You're uh, you're wearing is that what a Texans top? Nah, it's Oilers. This is it, Houston Oilers. Yeah. So you're going Mr. all the way back to Warren and uh, and his days as QB. All right, I'm that's trying one to for... ignore the the current two teams at the moment. Mm, yeah, <laughs> fair enough. Nick's already looking bored because we're talking about the NFL. But uh, Paul Young, a friend of mine, going way back, and and Paul, I'd I'd really like your thoughts on on what you've made of this season, which I think most Blades will look back on and say this has been one of the worst possible seasons, if not the worst season in living memory. For me, it's not the worst. Uh, any any of us can look back to the Adrian Eve era. Uh, we've also got the end of the Bassett era where where they were basically just doing long ball. Uh, and when we do that and you don't win, that's it's horrendous to watch. For this season, it's been bad. But I think we've lost a lot with, with the crowd not being there. And once we had that losing run of about three games on chart at the beginning of the season, that's when the confidence went. And I think that's going to be at least 50% of your skill uh, for your team to go forward. And it's it was always an uphill task from then. Yeah, so um, where do you attribute the blame uh, for this season? What's gone wrong? And, and I know we don't want to be a blame culture and all that, like, but... In, in a results-based business, you've got to assign some sort of blame, haven't you? I think it's just a, a mix of little things that's all added up. One of the main ones for me is no crowd there. Uh, we're very partisan crowd at the lane. Places like Manchester United, Arsenal, your Chelsea's, I don't think they have that partisan crowd. It's like an extra man. Uh, when, when our team needs picking up, the crowd gets on them and they get picked up. Whereas at Manchester United, if they need picking up, it's the exact same as an empty stadium. So all the benefit went to these other clubs that weren't used to that partisan crowd. We've got that. Then we've got the injuries to Jack O'Connell uh, and his other centre, well, his defenders, basically. Jack O'Connell's contribution can't be underestimated. It, his overlapping runs down that left-hand side, no one's been able to replicate so, and that was off at our attacking play, you know, the overlapping centre backs. Without that, as midfielders looked a bit, a bit empty, as if they're not got any options to go forward. Uh, so that's a contributing factor. Yeah, okay, the managers perhaps picked a few players that haven't so far come good, but Drogba took two years at Chelsea to come good. Uh, you know, so we've gone up at future. Hopefully, we can keep some of them. Uh, yeah, uh, could have got them lone players like the previous caller uh, very well said. You know, we could have had Lingard, we could have had the others. Uh, I've had reports myself that we was actually on a Zoom call of some kind with Lingard there, and it got pulled at the last minute. So wow. I don't know how true that is, but that's just what I've heard from from my sources. Uh, obviously, I'm not going to adjust the HP and tell you which source. Uh, so <laughs> That's why we got him on. <laughs> that kind of so, answer. So we can't... It, like I said, it's, one particular thing wouldn't have done us, I think. Uh, but I think not having the crowds, if I had to pick one, it's got to be that. Yeah. Because I think when we stopped having the crowds is when we started going down. We were doing well last season. We're all win all right, and then all of a sudden, no crowds, and as results start to peter off. Can I just say, I feel like last season, back end of the season, when there weren't any crowds, we were getting big, uh, we were getting up for the big, big game. So, obviously, we beat, we beat Chelsea, we beat Spurs at home, we beat Wolves in the last minute. I just felt like we got ourselves up for them big games, but that hasn't happened this season, has it? With, with Man United, we defended really, really well. 
other than that, the only games that you could say that we've got up for is the West Brom, which was an absolute must win. Um, yeah. There weren't many others, were they really? Newcastle, we were up for it. But we were we were quite lucky in the end because we created loads of chances, but we didn't take any. And uh, it were a penalty that got us through. So we just haven't been able to replicate that big game feeling that we did last season. Don't forget, I think towards the end of last season, we were still still running on the, the fumes of how well we were doing in the first part of the season. So obviously, when we're coming to end of last season, morale's not great running into the new season, a bit like what I think is going to happen this forthcoming season. So then when we started losing the first, like I said, three games, the morale and the, the confidence in the players, not wanting to take people on and be made a scapegoat type thing, that's that's where I think a lot of it's come from. Yeah, I quite agree. I mean, it's been a culmination of so many factors, uh, Paul. By the way, is the left peg thing, is that a little nod to uh, your friend and mine, uh, Wayne Quinn? It is, to be fair, yeah. Because I've got yeah. air like him now, because we haven't been able to... I look, like <laughs> an, I look like an early 90s boy band uh, cut. <laughs> uh, yeah, OK. <laughs> Let's go with that. Paul Young from inside his home sunbed. So, uh, <laughs> Paul, uh, this is a really hard question because there's so many choices. But what was your favourite Chris Wilder moment? Right, so there's so many. I think we all like Chris Wilder because, as everyone's going to say, he come across as the bloke who'll be sat next year on the cop uh, or the south stand, wherever wherever we are. In every interview, that's how we come across. But for me, I think it's got to be on the party bus on the 16, 17 season when we when he was hiding behind the front and then stood up with the cup, held it aloft and nearly went straight over the front. I nearly said something else then. <laughs> straight over the front and nearly dropped the trophy. To me, that's just... We're all celebrating. We're all there. We're not all perfect. Some things happen and we all have a laugh about it. Yeah. That's, that's, that's brilliant, that. That's brilliant. <laughs> Can we just have people in the comments just telling us theirs as well and, and Bobby in the background will pop them on screen because there's so many... Chris Wilder, epic moments. What's yours, Nick, I was going to say, what's yours? I mean, for me, do you know what's amazing? I managed to miss Bouncing Day because I was in Canada uh, with work. I was in uh, Gibraltar for Basham's arriving. I was there as well for uh, Forget the Maths with uh, Jack O'Connell's header. So I missed all of the, th sort of the three big ones that everyone would kind of point out. Uh, so you're, if I'm... you're just you're just talking about the team's moment, so it's not necessarily Chris Wilder moment, Al. There's loads. Well, I do, of okay, I love his his, his uh, get my haircut every three weeks speech. That was for me my favourite moment, right up there, and made me laugh a lot. Yeah, when Kev Cookson gave him another bottle of beer, and he's like, "I just need another one because I had enough." Oh, that also uh, spraying the sky guy with beer when he was getting interviewed. <laughs> <laughs> I liked that. that. When he was with Billy Sharp jumping yeah, up and down. Yeah, yeah, just being a little bit hammered. And also calling Leeds Muppets. I didn't dislike that. That was pretty good. What about, what about the you one know? where he's where he's got the uh, Peroni and mm. he's just been told about the advertisements that he could get for it and he's just mentioning <laughs> Peroni all the time. <laughs> that was superb. Go on, Nick, yours. My, my favourite, and I, I tweeted it out um, not too long ago, a few days ago, is the Klinsman dive against Coventry. You'll never see that again. You'll never right, see that right. another okay. manager. Bobby in the background, <laughs> he knows. Last time I was with Bobby, I was at a Chelsea game with Bobby and I missed that. <laughs> what? You missed the uh, the Coventry game? <laughs> yeah, I know. And <laughs> it, Do you know what? It's, it was Fleck scoring against his old club as well, weren't it? And Fleck doing the, uh, the Klinsman dive and just Chris Wilder just get he said afterwards he was embarrassed by it as well, but it was one of the best moments I've But when when a when a friend of yours like says to you weeks in advance, oh, I can get you a ticket for Chelsea Man City and the blades aren't playing on that night, and then our Coventry game got moved. And I was I was I'd obviously already said yes, you know, so I'm not gonna not go to a massive Premier League fixture like that. But then of course when I knew the Blades game was moved, I was like, Oh, Gotta be kidding me! But um, it was a great night, and we saw a we saw a decent game. But it, it, literally every major moment on the pitch sounds like I've missed. Are we sure you actually go to matches, Al? <laughs> <laughs> He's not Is really verified. <laughs> How 
Very dare you. He's just a presenter, that's all he is. He's not actually a fan here, Hal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, did, we did mention about Stephen Jagielka right at the start of the video, and thanks for that. Five pound, I still can't say your name. Hal, do you know what his name is? Let's go with Lucky 2.0. That's the one, that's the one. So, uh, yeah, thank you very much, Paul, for, for being no on. No problem. Oh, no, sorry, we've got one more. We've got one more, we've got oh. one more. Um, I'm, I'm wanted. Sorry about <laughs> that. It's just I was looking at the time thinking that that was it. Um, what are your thoughts on John Lundstrom st uh, still being in the first 11? Oh, dear. For me, keep him in. Uh, only thing we can do with youngsters at the moment is... Ruin, ruin the confidence. The team's down in confidence. We can ruin them. Knowing how injuries have been this year, we us, you know, we will end up with a double ACL on on his upcoming stars uh, for next season. So leave him in. Uh, I think in end of day, he's not playing that well to what his standards are. Uh, worst that that can happen, I think, is other teams will see what he's like, and he'll end up signing for us on. Two cheeseburgers and a hot dog for a week. <laughs> I think I that's, the very I, good I think, I think that's <laughs> amazing, though. Paul might be the only Blades fan in the world that wants uh, Lundstrom to stay in the team at the moment. But I do, I really it's like. A very good point. Yeah, you make a really good point, and I really like these kind of. Uh, contrarian opinions that aren't just going with the masses and also Paul while I got you on I just want to bring this comment up which I think is not that one they move as you as you as you're clicking on them don't they Nick um Spurs fan here yeah. uh Wilder deserves a proper finish now I think that's absolutely spot on we are not there to give him the the send-off and the round of applause Paul that Wilder deserves he deserves more than a round of applause and a lap of honour, obviously. But he's been on the journey. We've been on the journey with him. Obviously, not me. I've missed all the games. But we, as fans, wanted to say thank you and do it properly. And we've missed that opportunity, as we have with some players as well. Paul, how do you feel about that? I think Chris will know how grateful we all are uh, and how we wanted to give him that send-off and that lap of honour, basically, at the, uh, his last match. So I think he'll understand that and he he won't hold any, I won't say grudges or he won't hold any sad things about it. But who knows, you know, future games when everything's been patched up and we're on 98 points with 10 games to go in the championship, you know, his board might turn around and go, you know what, we can give him a, a special uh, lap of honour at half time for saying thank you. I wouldn't hold I don't your think breath. he'll do that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think that'll happen if we're, we're on 10 points in bottom three. But I think there'll be other ways we can say thank you to, to Chris. I hope so. Uh, I really you know, hope they, so. It could hold a, a meet and greet type thing, you know, at so the uh, City Hall, you know, where he can say about some stories that, unless he's got a gagging order, but say about stories and funny stories behind the scenes, have a few of his mates turn up, uh, said Derek French, he'll have some good stories and we can all like say thank you there at the end i think that's a great shout frenchy will have and, and chris wilder if you're watching you're welcome to come on here and do another fans forum with us and everyone can say their thanks that way uh we will just say thanks to paul young don't forget to put the goggles on paul when you lie down in the sunbed that's very very important and uh thank you <laughs> so much it's, for <laughs> it's a brilliant shirt. it matches the uh the lighting uh paul young <laughs> thank you i will chat to you again after this but really appreciate that no problem. Thank you all for having me. Oh, that was great. Another great one, Hal. Yeah, I've got a lot of time for Paul. He's got a lot of... Uh, he's got different opinions. That's what we want. We want uh, a mix of opinions. Now, the one thing we want to get in the comments is, do you, as you're watching this, actually think that Chris Wilder should have gone? We're getting a lot of uh, popular opinion, which generally seems to be Chris Wilder should have stayed. And I think Nick and I are, are fairly, it's fairly obvious where we sit on that particular fence, but we want your thoughts. If you're actually thinking results were so terrible and results cost him and it was a, it's a results business, and that's what you think, please put that in the comments. You will not be castigated here. We want a variety of opinions. We absolutely do. And we're going to get another opinion right now from uh, the big man, JC. Here he is. How are you doing, mate? All right, lads. I did, Lynn. <laughs> Not bad, not bad. The big got, man JC. Uh, you've got okay. three hands. You've got three hands. One in your chest, two on your... It's not, it's not party trick. But... 
So we, we love that T-shirt. Absolutely love it. Absolutely, yeah. James yeah. Cheatham, who many will have seen on uh, Fans React, thank you very much for being uh, back with us. So Wilder leaving, I think the big question that a lot of fans have been asking is that statement. James, I made my opinion very clear on Twitter that I felt that statement was not befitting of a manager who'd achieved so much and you'd see a better statement for a caretaker manager. What did you make of the statement the club put out? Poor. So, so poor. Totally agree. A couple of lines about what happened. Um, a quote from Wilder, nothing from the Prince, which I think is that maybe symbolic of the relationship between Wilder and the Prince at the end, is the Prince maybe distanced himself from it all, doesn't want to get involved. Yeah, it deserves so much more. But I think the whole way it was handled was terrible in the first place with this statement. Um, I checked on Friday morning about 10 a.m., uh, just looked on Twitter. There was rumours then about Wilder's gone. And I, I couldn't believe it. I was just, you know, constantly refreshing Twitter then all day. About 11 o'clock, Sky, uh, Sky News, Sky Sports News broke it as well there. But this is Friday morning. And then it wasn't until Saturday night at quarter to nine it was confirmed. And that's just dreadful. We, we had nothing. I, I know there's, you know there's legal implications, gagging orders, what have you, but even a placeholder to say, look, there's something going on. Um, we're handling the situation. We'll tell you more when we know it. When we know it. But there's nothing. I mean, you take today, for example, there's been 10 tweets from the club today, and yet there was nothing between Friday morning and Saturday night. And yeah, it, we, had that, we had that dog, one. though, didn't we? We had that dog on the main screen for, uh, for yeah, several well, days. Yeah, that's, yeah that made, I felt better about that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it made all the difference. It was a, lo it was a uh, lovely Labrador, let's not get it twisted, but it's not what we as fans were going onto the main page to actually quite, see. No. And it, it felt weird. It was a very specific time. It was bang on quarter to nine at night, and I kind of think... Have they waited for the players and the coach staff to leave Bramall Lane? Avoid people turning up there. They're not getting any, any aggro from them. Um, and also doing it now before fans come back to the stadium. Because I think if yeah, we were back at the stadium, you could imagine there'd be a lot of uh, shoes off in car parks and a lot of trouble. So it seems slightly devious to me, the, the timing of it as well. Absolutely. Absolutely, mate. Um, so we said that it wasn't a very good kind of statement put out by the club. Would you like to see that uh, something come from the club, whether it be a video, whether it be just a post with a few nice words, or even a statue in the club? build the statue? Now you're Google talking, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah. So the media team are normally really good. I don't know. I saw that Johnny from the Show Review called them out on Twitter and asked him what was going on. He's not had a response to that. It was really weird. Um, and then you've got you know Kenny Jacket and Lee, Lee Bowyer getting their tributes. And where's Wilders? And we've had to have we've had fan led tributes. So BBC Radio Sheffield did a good one, but yeah, where, where's the really good video from our media team? It's again, is it have they been silenced? It's, it's really I think, I, think, I think they have. Yeah, yeah they, they and, must and, have had something ready, surely. Yeah, and but I mean, I'm I'm thankful in a way that you know it's 2021 and he's been immortalised in memes and gifts and, and merchandise. At least he's got that. But yeah, we we, we, we need that video. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of a statue, it was a tricky one for me because I, I love a good statue. And uh, my first reaction don't was, yeah, of course, let's get, let's get a statue. <laughs> as long as I we mean, don't get the guy who made Cristiano Ronaldo's statue. Yes, <laughs> or the Beckham one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but you've got, what, Joe Shaw and, and Derek Dooley in the car park. That's a big car park. There's, there's room for more statues in there, surely. But I was thinking, what about Bassett? You know, Bassett had a good record. He's not got a statue. There's, should should by that reasoning should Wilder not get a statue, but maybe they should both have statues. You know, both really good records. I think you know Wilder's got the edge because we know he's you know ball boy, player, manager. Yeah, get him a statue. Can You're someone right. make it happen? Someone listening tonight, make it happen, please. If you build statues and you're watching, please. Uh, it, it is a big car park, uh, James. You're absolutely right. That car park is also fantastic for celebrations. We've seen so many in yes. that car park. It's like it was built for that. I don't, I've not been to too many of the Premier League grounds where they've actually got decent car parks for celebrations. Mm. It's not something that's normally on the top of the list when you're planning a stadium. But uh, but ours is. It's just one of those nice things that happened by accident. And I personally think that it would be wonderful to see him rewarded like that. I don't think he will be. Um, I think that no. the sort of acrimonious no, well with the acrimonious end you know we're not placing blame i think it's very important nick and i mentioned that we're not placing blame on either side the more we hear and the more we read it sounds a little bit mm. more that it's not there's not a goodie and a baddie in this it actually sounds like 
it's not black and white and there are two sides and maybe some people have been a bit stubborn on one side and some people have been trying to do things their way on the other side and I can totally understand if you, let's say as you Chris Wilder, have had things your own way and you've run it from root to stem, top to bottom, you've implemented your style from the first team all the way down to uh, our wonderful under 18s, our youth team of course playing in the cup uh, as we speak at the moment. Uh, if you've had that that system in place and then you do hear, well actually yes, you're doing really, really well, but we actually want to change things. I can understand why you would say, well, hang on, I've got you here. Uh, yeah. The reason you've got all this money to spend is because of me. I can understand why you'd be hesitant for any change. And as Yorkshire folk, change is not good. But I can also understand why you would look at the models that have worked in the Premier League if you are in an owner's position and say, these have worked. Look at these clubs. Most clubs now have yeah. these in place. Now, I'm, I'm yeah. actually... Not sure a director of football has ever actually been mentioned by the Prince. And it's possible. Would Nick, would you say it's possible that the director of football isn't going to be brought in and may never happen? I think it's definitely possible. Uh, I think a lot's been said about directors of football, uh, someone being a head, like one of the managers being a head coach. There's a lot of things thrown about. Um, but from, from sources that have uh, come can't even say what sources <laughs> but, uh, from from uh, from those sources go on, go on. Uh, we, we, we found out that it's not all cut and dry it's not kind of this is definitely happening we it's still up in the air we don't know i think like you said there's a gagging order and stuff like that so i don't think everything's going to come out i don't think the fans are going to ever know what exactly is gonna like did happen but we're definitely going to know what's going to happen in the future so mm. i'd like the club to come out and actually tell the fans what's happening because that's yeah. what's going to silence the fans. If the um, if the board comes out or, or Prince Abdullah or Betis come out and say we're not selling players, we're going to try and build. Um, well, we're going to try and rebuild the squad, try and do it a different way. We want to hear that. That's exactly what we yeah. want to hear as fans because that's what's going to get you back on board with the fans. But yeah. th there's a long way to go right now because obviously with what's happened with Wilder. Um, they're not really telling us what's happening and then obviously not giving them a good send-off. It's all going to kind of, it's all making it worse for us, isn't it? We're, we're thinking everything, we're thinking everything and anything. And as yeah. you say, Nick, I think uh, the Prince won't come out and obviously gives the details, but it'd be nice for him to come out, just thank Wilder, and as you say, then tell us what happens next. You know, that this is the plan, give some confidence to the, the fans. Spawn. Spot on, James. And, and what are your hopes personally for the remainder of what feels like a season that's never going to end? Gosh, I, I think, I mean, what, what can we achieve really? I, I think some momentum is the main thing for me. Momentum is going to the championship because, you know, with the heads down, the players are the heads down at the minute and the results we're getting. I, I do worry. I don't think we'll go straight, you know, down to League One, like some people are saying, but I think we may struggle with this former in the minute going into the championship. We need to build some momentum, get some confidence back, avoid injuries. Too many injured players. We don't want to get any more serious injuries, and get the fans back. You know, I'm looking forward to the potential to go to these matches at the end of the season. Uh, it's been so so oh, it's been great to be back there. I mean, team wise, I disagree with left peg. I would drop Lunny. I would put Berger on the pitch in a wheelchair. I think over Lunny at the minute. Did you um, just disagree with left peg? I did. As in Paul oh, Young, okay. not Wayne Quinn. If you are just tuning in, that's uh, Paul who we had on previously, not Quinny. <laughs> I went there. <laughs> um, I, I wouldn't drop Ampadu. We, we maybe can't anyway because there might be some financial implications of dropping him. But I think you know, keeping there anyway, we, we're, we're struggling for defensive cover as it is. But get, I give more minutes to Brewster and McBurney. They're probably going to be our partnership in the championship. They've performed well there. Give them more minutes. Uh, the, the, the Brewster thing's so strange. I love to know what's going on there. Why isn't getting more minutes? Um, and yeah, and, and I think just yeah, the hopes for the season. I'd just say to fans, you know, it's, it's really nasty place to be in right now. But just remember to support the badge. And not individuals. Don't get bogged down on that. We're, you know, we're, we're blaze. This has been, this is the life of being a blade. This has happened to us before. It'll probably happen again. And just support the badge. Absolutely. I think as well. Uh, the last question was going to be about the ownership. I think we've, we've pretty much covered that. Is there anything else that you want to say about that before you go, Mr. JC? Yeah, I probably say just, just quickly. So I, I agree. There's, you know, it's not goodies and baddies. I think. Um, it's mixed with the owner. This, this situation aside, the owner has been good to us. You know, he's said the right things at fans' forums. He's been active on social media, talking to the fans. He's backed Wilder with big money for signings. You know, even starting in, in summer, summer 2019, we were spending big money. But he, he's, he's not rich enough. End of the day, 
and it's not his fault. You know, in League One, we're a rich club. In the Championship, we're pretty good. In the Premier League, we're, we're miles off. And if he remains the owner and we somehow if we become a yo-yo team, we get back in the Premier League, we're going to struggle again. We're not going to be able to attract these players and pay the wages. Uh, and, and that's not really his fault. It's just we, we've been, as we said before, been victims of our own rapid success. Um, but for me, as I said before, I think he, he needs to come out, thank Wilder and just tell us what's happening next. Can I just say, James, that point about, that's absolutely brilliant what you just said there, but that point about the Prince doesn't have all this money, that's not his fault. It's mm. not his fault. Nick yeah. and I and you, we don't have that money either. We'd love to, but it's not our fault that we don't. We all work hard. Uh, and it's, you know, I just feel like it, it's, it's not a bottomless pit. I mean, we'd all love to have a bottomless pit of money. No one yeah. does. And our Prince, our owner, certainly doesn't. And I'm sure if he did have the money to throw around and spend absolutely everything he'd wanted to, he would have done, but also he's got yeah. to look out for the long-term future of the club. So uh, I think maybe the frustration has come for Wilder with watching our ownership by other clubs when things like the training ground have needed fixing. I think things like that have maybe yeah. rubbed him the wrong way, and we can get into that another time. But James, thank you. It's a pleasure, lads. All the blades. See you, mate. Always good to get James Cheatham on. Uh, we don't see him enough on uh, Fans React, but we... Uh, we do have another another man who's who's got an opinion or two uh, when it comes to the internet. <laughs> it's a good job that we didn't ask the ownership question to this next guy, isn't it, Hal? I, th I think it is, yes. Uh, Johnny from Shoreham View, your friend and mine, and uh, <laughs> here he is. Shoreham View I'm, is a disgrace. I brought, my, I brought my own thing in case I forget what my language is going, so if I drop a <laughs> bomb, it'll be all right. <laughs> <laughs> that actually, that actually worked really well. Yeah, uh, please don't don't do that again. Uh, so, Johnny, let's talk about the blame. And I would like to know where do you think the blame lies over this entire Chris Wilder saga, which is what we're calling it. See, for this, for this, I'm going to show you how my feelings have changed and where I think the blame lies. Using what I call the Wilder circle of grief. <laughs> so. So while they were psyched, it might need to come closer to the camera. So while they were psyched, and then you enter this bubble of grief and anger where you blame everybody but Wilder. Then you <laughs> then you listen to Blades Pod and Tufty Club, and you kind of accept that maybe things aren't as bad as you think, unless you're me, and then you go straight back into grief and anger. <laughs> <laughs> um, so to me, look. I, People know where I stand. I'm not happy with the board, with the situation there. I'm not going to go too much into it. I'm not going to have a massive tarry like I did on mine. That's out my system now. And I'm just going to lay down some points. that I, I don't think people see the bigger picture with the board. I agree that he's not as rich as he could, as, as an owner of the premiership needs to be, and that isn't his fault. But he's also made some really, really poor decisions that have... That have meant Wilder has had to push through a move to another club or, or push through leaving because he just doesn't feel he can do anything. I mean, when you've got the board signing players under his nose that can't play for the team for three years, when they won't even invest in a, a new training pitch, how's he going to feel with that? And I, I think I'd understand where he's coming from on that. And it's brought us back to this horrible scenario now where we're all grieving for a manager lost, but we've got a team to support. We have to move on. We have to get everything that we want to say out of our systems so we can then support the badge of the club and the players and give, because th this can't be good for them. Look at Billy Sharp's interview the other day. Look how he felt. Uh, they need a lift and that goes in the ground to do it. So the only thing we can do is try and get behind the best we can, no matter who's in the, who's in the dugout and who's in the owner's, uh, owner's box. I think that's Johnny, one thing. Can, can I, I just say, when I was laughing there, when you talk about Billy, uh, I wasn't laughing because of Billy's <laughs> comments, which really upset me. I was laughing because of... Uh... <laughs> Of that comment, <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> which came, came in at the wrong time. <laughs> came in at the wrong time. So why? Why? Hey, I'm back on wow. again. Hey, oh. technology! What what yeah. they can do these days, eh? Wow. I don't I don't like having my room well lit. It means you can see everything. It's a good thing I did everything, eh? Mm. I love but, that you uh, programmed it to understand the Sheffield accent as well. That's good effort. That, that took a lot of time and effort. I will tell you something now. Room but why? Do I? No, mind it, mind it, mind it. <laughs> Can we talk about football again? I'm not my bro. I'm in bedroom. <laughs> I think Cameron anyway. got it last time, didn't they? Cameron got it worse with his, with his room. Mm. He did. But 
can we all see where I'm coming from, though? But it is all right to be angry and get that out of your system as long as you're still supporting the team on the pitch at the end of the day. Because I think that's what people have seemed to have forgotten a little bit. Quite a lot of fans were saying, do we even care about the Leicester game? And I hated that. I really yeah. hated that so yeah. much. Because everybody's been banging on about, I'm a bigger fan, I'm a bigger fan, I'm a bigger oh. fan. When, when the crunch time comes and you need to support the lads, some people say, oh, I'm not going to watch it. I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. That's not for me. I'm not happy no, with that at all. Fully agree with that. Yeah, when yeah. you look at it, I don't like this, I'm a bigger blade than you stuff. Everybody can, have a, everybody can agree with whatever they want to agree with. But at the end of the day, the people who support the club will be there week in, week out. I've seen people saying, that's it, done with the club, I'm finished supporting United and this, that, and that. You haven't, mate. You'll be there. You'll be going through them turnstiles like rest of us and you'll be clapping along. And if we start winning a few games, we're all a fickle bunch, let's admit it. And we'll all be clapping away, singing whoever's name's in dugout. That's I'm how it goes. Then I thought another way to <laughs> when you said bunch. <laughs> <laughs> no, I behave on this channel just for your benefit. <laughs> Um, so, do you think this all has been brewing for a while? We've all heard a lot of rumours in the past about while the handing is noticing and stuff, but nothing's ever been concrete. Do you think it's been brewing a while, Janet? Personally, on my own opinions, this is just my own opinions, I'm not saying anything more than that, I think it's been brewing since beginning of the pre-season, to be honest with you. I think that maybe certain people, again, just my opinion, think Wilder can deliver the same miracles as he had before. When realistically, we didn't have the depth in the squad to keep producing these miracles. You see what happened when we lost Jack O'Connell. Everything we do depends on that left-hand side. And without it, you've seen how we suffered. And without squad depth there, it was never, ever going to improve, was it? So I think it's been brewing since then. It's been brewing since the training ground situation. I mean, we all know that we, we don't exactly have modern facilities there. And it, it's going to wind people up, especially when you've got roofs caving in, etc. It. It's been simmering. It's been simmering to boiling point. And unfortunately, it's had to get to this. In the ideal world, the board, Chris Wilder, gear each other a massive hug, say, sorry, let's move on. Let, let's put this to bed and move. But we haven't got there, have we? That, that's not the situation we're in. And it's a shame. Did you think that was ever going to happen, Johnny? Because I, in the back of my mind, thought that that was going to happen. Because Chris Wilder is such a massive blade. I thought there were going to be some sort of U-turn at some point. I've got to be careful what I say here. Um, the thing is, I think it got to a stage where Chris maybe will have put a plan for next season forward. Maybe. Just say, just point it out there that he maybe got a plan to put forward and it didn't suit the vision for the club held by the board. And by that point, I, I think Wilder's already known that his time's up. Um, and to leave on your own terms... As, as dramatic as an horrible, sorry, as dramatic and as horrible as it has been for us, let, let's be fair. I think it must be for him. He don't want to leave. He's, he's, a, he's a Blades fan, he, and nobody wants to leave the club under these circumstances. But to leave on your own terms is probably better than to be ousted in the championship. Maybe next season. Who knows? Johnny, what would you like to see happen next for huh. Sheffield United Football Club? Uh, I'd like to see uh, Elon Musk buy the club. <laughs> Immediately bring Wilder back, um, you know, invest in some decent players and go on a giant winning spree and have the most unrealistic success that we could ever hope for. That's the dream. In realistic terms, what I'd like to happen is I'd like some stability now. Whether the board's still up or not, for good come bad, no matter what my opinions or other fans' opinions are, this is the board we've got. Going forward, we need to get this managerial appointment right. We need to get the coaching staff right. We can't have Alan Neil being the highest paid corn layer at the club. We need to we need to have a chat between the club and see what's best for Alan, whether he wants to be there or whether he doesn't. A decision needs to be made there. And we need to get some stability and we need to get some confidence in the players because nothing's lifting them at the minute. And if we get into the championship and they've had after all these highs. And they have this flat run. And then there's instability and uncertainty at the beginning of the next season. We're in for another bad one. So we need to get everything right. We need to get everything in preparation and think, this season's gone. Start building now for next season. So we've got the best platform going forward. And as much as it pains me to say it, because you know I'm not happy with the board, we need to, we, we need to keep his opinions to ourselves and let's see if they can get it right. Because if they can get it right, a lot... As much as it pains me, a lot will be forgiven. 
Yeah, I think you're absolutely bang on, mate. I think a lot of fans uh, took comfort in the fact that Alan Nil uh, and Matt Prestridge are still at the club. Um, what do you think about Alan Nil still being at the club? Do you think he's going to be there for long? No, no. Um, but Johnny, can you see that he wouldn't leave unless he's kind of forced to leave because he's got a new contract and he could get paid off if you know they finally pushed him out? But at the moment, he lives in Sheffield. He's at a good age to be just happy and staying where he is. I think he's happy to be the highest paid ball boy at the club, if needs be. Ideally, I, I think for his own sanity, I think he'd like to leave. Again, careful what I say. I, I just think that if the club could afford to pay him off, they would do. I don't think Alan's the kind of guy who'll make it toxic. He'll go in, he'll do his job. With as with as mediocre enthusiasm as he can and still get away with it without being detrimental. Because that's the last thing he wants. You know what? He's not the kind of bloke who will be want to cause problems. He just wants to go in, do his nine to five and get out. And until we pay him off, that's all he's going to do. Yeah, spot on. I, th I think Alan Neal's a really good bloke. So you're right. He won't want to cause any problems. No, definitely not. He's, he's an old school, he was an old school football player, old school coach. Doesn't like being the guy in front of the cameras. So that I don't think, I think that rules him out of being the manager at any point. I think he's just happy to just be there and do the bare minimum until at such time Chef United see it fit not to keep his services on. And if that's what Alan needs to do for himself and his family, that's what Alan needs to do. Do you think that he's waiting for Chris Wilder to get another job before he, uh, he jumps ship? Not that the jump ship sounded, sound, didn't sound very nice, that because he's an absolute legend just as much as Chris Wilder is. But do you think that could be the case? It could be. It could be that he's waiting for Chris to call him up to his next job. Financial implications of that may may not work out as well as we think, though. It depends where he's going, who he's going to. Chris could... We're all seeing the book, his favourite Celtic manager, this manager, that manager. Chris could be out of work for two years. Who knows? He might not and fancy I, it. And actually, these, these rumours, Johnny, that Chris doesn't want to work with the director of football. Now, whether they're true or not, chairman, we've already seen with Simon Jordan, uh, chairman oh. will will be wary, won't they, surely, of appointing a manager that has no interest in working with a structure that is in place at most top clubs? That, that's another big point. I mean, I, I'm not, I don't know the ins, ins and outs of Scottish football. I'll hold my hands up and say it. Um, I've had enough of League One, so I want to watch that. But, <laughs> he was but, doing so well. <laughs> but that's the thing. I, if Celtic have a director of football and Chris Wilder says, I don't want to manage that way, why is he going to go to Celtic and be a manager there when his system he does not like? So do I think Chris Wilder could have been a, a lot more careful in what he said? Yeah, in the same way I could be a lot more careful in what I say, but he said it, it's out there, it's in the public domain. Whether people overlook that and think, you know what, he's a top-class manager, we'll make adjustments for him. That, that's down to the club, isn't it? That's what they see as their, their vision going forward. But that's another reason why Chris might not see any jobs that he feels he wants to take. He could sit on the seven million for the next two years and see what he wants to do then. And in that case, like back to the original point, Chris isn't uh, sorry, Alan's not gonna fly off anywhere when he's getting paid a decent wedge of money here. So it's it's all up in the air. And that's one thing that does irritate me a little bit is while everything's up in the air, nothing can be sorted. And while nothing can be sorted, we're going to be in the same position at the beginning of the next season. And that is the last thing we want. Can you imagine if we, there's so much insecurity and instability when fans are back in ground? That will not be a nice atmosphere. To go from the cusp of Europe, the last time the fans were there, to go to absolute pain, misery and abuse the next time fans are there, that's not good for anybody, is it? No. No, well said. I think some of your points have been absolutely spot on. Celtic do have a director of football, so it'd be interesting to see that. Also, a lot of people saying Eddie Howe coming in, I mean, he did fall out with Jason Tindall, so yeah. it doesn't mean because Tindall's at Bramall Lane that Eddie Howe necessarily follows. Do you not see Eddie Howe as having this similar personality to Nigel Atkins? A very happy-go-lucky, everything's positive kind of tune. That well, you said a, a nice person. <laughs> yeah, we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't do, want that. No, <laughs> we're, we're room for that. I see Eddie Howe's being an Nigel Atkins type. Who, when we lose three four nil, or go on Radio Sheffield and go, oh, it was a it was a great performance. Need to show more endeavour. And I don't think it was anything bad from the lads. Just wasn't our day. And then when the cameras and the radio turns off, like it will crap that. But that yeah. That's that's something I see Eddie Howe being like, and I don't think it fits this. The reason why they did so well, apart from tactics and all that kind of stuff, is not so much this season. I'd have had some gripes with Wilder this season about his, his briefings and his interviews. 
But especially last season, season before, if you didn't like something, you'd go out and you say it. Mm. And that, that it's own with us if the team's not played particularly well. And I think we need another manager in that same in that same mould, really. Not so much we want a wilder clone, but we want somebody to come in and say it as it is and not hide behind, you know, pick a catchphrase. It's we need really? that shield, honestly. Room for improvement. Yeah, I mean, Wilder has been very honest in a number of interviews. Uh, sometimes too honest. By that, I mean he may have said some things that upset the board when he, you know, talked about backing and and, and possibly made a rod for his own back. But uh, Johnny, we, on that. <laughs> yeah, uh, Johnny, we've kept you for far too long. Thank you very much for coming on. We really You're appreciate it. Thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure, guys. Cheers, Johnny. It's hot, man. <laughs> Johnny, he's a lad. He's an absolute lad. Yeah, when you say lads, lads, lads at the start, and you should have just shown a screenshot of us three. <laughs> I think that just sums it up. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we've got another lad coming in in a second, and I've just seen him turn his camera, which I am very, very, very happy about. So uh, here we go. We have got Mr. Pie himself. Oh, he's turning it back. What is he doing? Uh, Mr. Pie himself, Paul Cormack, and he's turned it back. Oh. No, no, that's... That way. Hang on. Do it that way. That's the one. No, oh, upside down according to this though. Oh, no, that's that's better like that. That is better. It, oh. it won't it won't correct itself every time I do it. It goes upside down. I think it were fine before. Uh, before it went, it and then we'll go no, with it. Won't it. because it's gonna have to do. It's gonna have to do. Have to How am that. I supposed to follow that? By the way, you, you're gonna struggle. Yeah. I'm literally tuned in. I was thinking, I didn't realize Johnny were on. And then I'm like, I'm following Johnny again. Brilliant. Don't worry. He, sti don't worry. he, he stitched me up far too much though recently as well. So I'm just now follow I'm just living in his shadow, I'm like his five second shadow. <laughs> I'm, I'm just a bit gutted that you're not laying on a bed like this. You are normally. I didn't, I didn't think it was uh, appropriate based on no swearing and stuff. So I thought I better at least put some clothes on. Be, be vertical. <laughs> Have clothes on. I've got a haircut though, so it's a different audience. Right, we won't ask how. Instead, no, we'll move uh, we'll move on. Yeah, you did it yourself, didn't you? Definitely. Yeah. Um, so, what were you? Thank you for having me on. Oh, yeah, no problem, mate. It's great to have you on. Finally, it's great to have you on. I know. Yeah, I've been offering. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, what were you feeling when you heard the news about Chris Wilder? So, I had two feelings initially based on. Man, obviously, first of all, was sadness um, due to like the unimaginable success of his first four years. I just genuinely believe that he should have been given at least until Christmas. There was a Radio 2 caller, I think, that I've heard where he was saying, at least give him until Christmas. If it's not working out by that point, then move into a different direction and go with someone like Eddie Howe, potentially. Um, so, yeah, I was just gutted at the fact that he's not been able to see out a season, whether that was on his own terms or whether that was because of background interference i'm just it just doesn't sit right with me so it's left me feeling a bit sad and then the second feeling was anger really because i actively backed the prince on social media um said it was better than mccabe and then he's kind of done a scooby-doo on us and pulled his mask off and revealed kevin mccabe again and just done what kevin mccabe does best and just alienates the entire club within two or three minutes and before you know it, the best person that's ever walked through his door, potentially. Obviously, I'm not going to be around in 100 years' time to see someone else come and do it, but in my dad's lifetime and my lifetime so far, my son's lifetime, he's the best bloke that's ever come to this club and finished as high as we've ever finished, more points than we've ever had before, 100 points in League One, and he's had to walk out the door for whatever reason. And Paul, how do you feel the club's handled this entire situation? <laughs> Oh, it's like talking to my mum being called Paul. <laughs> um, Mr. Pie. <laughs> just call me Pie. Uh, not well. I just don't I don't think they've I don't think they've handled it well at all. Um we give Jack Rodwell a celebration for his birthday and yet we couldn't even say all the best to us, greatest ever manager. Um it took idiots like Jim White to announce it at ten past nine on a whatever day morning it were that he'd left club and yet You've got people on social media saying he's left. I've seen him leave and I've had this confirmed, I've had that confirmed. And yet it took the club, what, two days since it happened to make that announcement. That's just not appropriate at all. We might not be the biggest club in the world. We might not be Man United. We might not be Arsenal or Chelsea, but <clears throat> we deserve some respect as fans for putting our money into the club. Granted, none of us have put a penny in this year, but over our lifetimes, thousands, home and away, getting up, travel, everything. We deserve a little bit more 
than to hear it from cretins on social media that as managers left. Absolutely, cretins. I love the word. That you put. Cretins. I haven't heard that word for a long time. I'll just point out that Nick and I have bought the shirts <coughs> this season, and I've still bought the programs. So I've done my, my yeah. the, the most I could <coughs> to put some money into the club. I'm same, and I even proactively said at the start of the season, I would buy my season ticket if it meant that mm. we was going in the right direction and we were investing. If if the prince came out and said, "Listen, we need your season ticket money so that we can do X, Y, and Z." I've heard stories that when McCabe left, he's ripped all PCs out of the building because they, he bought them apparently out of his own money. And I've heard that Curry's have had to supply um, items for the officers because he's taken them when he's lost his court battle. So I would have been happy to provide my season ticket money. Do you know what I mean? I, would. I, wouldn't, have had an, I wouldn't have had an issue with that based on what we got last year was more value for money than what you could have ever imagined. The statement last year going into this season the prices were going to stay the same. You get a pro route, a refund for the games you've missed. I would have more than happy to have gone, there you go, Mr. Prince. That's my money. I'd have done the same. Spot, spot on, well said. And now I feel like, Mr. Pye, and now I feel like that's kind of been taken away. That that attitude that I've got now has been taken away through like a wolf in sheep's clothing, really. Mm. I like the way that you explained the Scooby-Doo reference earlier. <clears throat> I didn't have a Scooby-Doo yeah. talking about. But, <laughs> yeah, uh, and Scooby-Doo when they pulled the mask off and like, yeah, that was him all along. Such a, it's, such a it, great meme. Yeah. Um, and it, it just sums him up though, doesn't it? Do you know what I mean? Like you, you proactively back him because you think, who's the better of the two evils? The guy that's supposedly put no money in. But then, you, I mean, it's, what the point I'm trying to make is the guy who's supposed to put no money in against the guy who's defrauded money out of the club and now it just looks like that's going to be the case this season and I'm not saying the signings have been like amazing or anything with regards to who we've signed and Chris Wilder is potentially accountable for some of that in his own, his own downfall but with Prince at the minute it feels like we're just going in the same direction as what McCabe did in the same way with, we went with who was the other one Green weren't it that we had who defrauded us out of thousands and millions. Charles Green, just to say that when yeah. you talk about uh, defrauding, that's the opinions of Mr Pye, not necessarily yeah. <laughs> the opinions of the Chef United way. I just want to make that very clear. That's fine. Anyway, I think we should um, move on from defraud, defrauding right now. Yeah, well, that, well, that's a defraud. But again, <laughs> just, just to cover my point about the Prince as well, I'm not saying it's 100% him that's accountable. Like Johnny made some great points to say that he's not happy with how Wilde has conducted himself this season in certain aspects. And I'm not. But the the fact of the matter is, when you're a Premier League club, there's a certain structure that you have. And Chris Wilder didn't sign up to that. He signed up to a League One club. He signed up to no director of football. He signed up to having complete control over the club because Kevin McCain was in charge and it was his best friend. And he said, there you go, Mr Wilder, look after my club. And he went, OK. And he got us 100 points. He got us 60 odd points following season. Then he got us promoted. Then he got us a top 10 finish. Then the Prince obviously has taken over and he said, I want a director of football. But then while they say, but that's not what I've agreed to. And that's where relationships get struck because it's like having a bird and then they're changing their mind all of a sudden saying, that's not what I signed up because you, you put a bit of weight on. Again, to, the, the opinions of Mr. Pye. <laughs> <laughs> you have to adapt. I think I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, hit, I'm gonna hit you with something quite similar to what you've just said, because well, Chris Wilder had obviously <laughs> spent a lot of money on players that hadn't really pulled up many trees. So is it not like your girlfriend changing her mind after you've cheated on you? Oh, I'm not. Maybe. I'm, <laughs> maybe. All, um, all, all I'm trying to say is that um, Chris Wilder hasn't necessarily spent the money that wisely and i think that's what the prince totally agree is, yeah totally agree the prince is getting at and and i think he was maybe just <clears> trying <throat> to offer a bit of support in regards to recruitment because i think the yeah. recruitment team's only pretty strong and that includes chris wilder and, and paul mitchell and, and one and one uh, other and it it does really look like we are spending a lot of money on homegrown talent if you like and not really looking abroad too much and that, and the thing is, with the homegrown talent, they're always going to cost way more money. So they're obviously not. Other, Brewster was Brewster's uh, yeah. played the Premier League club for a long time, but he's not actually proven in the Premier League. What? And everybody else that we've gone for, not proven in the Premier League. So when you're spending a lot of money on them, they've got to hit the ground running, and, and yeah. most of them haven't, have they? 
What I will say in support of the Prince is the rumour about Sanderberg where Wilder wanted him, Prince wanted to buy him in the summer, and Wilder said, I want him now, I can get you a top 10 finish or top 4 finish, whatever we were trying to argue the point of at the time. Prince bought him out of his own money and then took the money out of the transfer fund for the following season. That was documented. Um, I don't think I'm wrong in saying that. And then, for whatever reason, it didn't work that first season. Obviously, he needed time to bed in. And then this season, Berg started really well. Unfortunately, got injured. Not his fault, not really Wilder's fault. But you can understand why the Prince may feel a gripe at the fact that he's potentially lost out on some of that money. Then this season, the rumour was Liverpool wanted a, um, a full-on purchase, but United wanted a loan to buy. Liverpool pulled out, apparently. Wilder said, I want him. And Prince, again, bent over and gave Wilder what he wanted. Now, unfortunately for Brewster, he wasn't first choice, and we all know that. Um, there were far bigger and better players that were first choice. We wanted Wilson. We wanted um, Watkins, who was obviously our number one target. Even down to McBurney, where we wanted more pie first. And the Prince had to go with Wilder's second, third or fourth choice players. Um but when you're buying someone for 23.5 million or whatever it were in Brewster, it's got to work. And I don't care what anyone says where they say you know, on social media, you've got to defend him. It's his first season. It weren't supposed to be like this. But I'm sorry, 23.5 million, no matter how old you are, you're going to have to score goals. And that's where the Prince will be looking at it in, in like that opinion sort of thing where it's not worked. That is money. That's genuinely money waste. That's like paying me to do a job and not turning up and saying, I'm bedding in. I think the thing is with that, I think that it's not... I wouldn't blame Brewster for that. I think you've got to blame Wilder more for that because he's... But cup games, I'm sorry. Cup games, we've played some toss teams in cups. You've got to be scoring. Even I would score against Bristol Rovers. Like, Hey, they gave us the best game of anyone in the cup so far, (laughs) Bristol Rovers. But it were a goal fest. Anyone could score. Like, the keeper, if he'd had a shot, would have probably scored on either team. Do you know what I mean? Like... Burke scored and Burke is terrible at finishing. He's awful at finishing. That's like his worst part of his game. I mean, he's great at everything else, but he can't finish. And yet Brewster hits the ball too cleanly and it just doesn't go in ever. And that's that is unlucky, but there's only a certain amount of time you can say it's unlucky and then it just becomes poor. And I think at the minute he's looking at a poor is looking like a poor signing. Yeah. I think you're probably right, but let's move on to uh, another point because uh we're going to ask you now for your ideal replacement, and I mean realistic replacement, not obviously Pep Guardiola or... Yeah, yeah, Pep. Um, it has to be Eddie Howe, would it? I think if anyone could... I mean, I've seen, I've seen people with uh, Lampard. Absolutely no chance. Guys, tactically inept. Um, it would be Eddie Howe for me. Um, I didn't know he'd fallen out with Tyndall. I was putting two and two together and making five, by the sounds right. I didn't know he'd fallen out with Tyndall. Um Eddie Howe, I'm not keen on Michael Appleton, Appleton, sorry. I don't think he's done enough. Um, there's not really many names floating about. I mean, there's um, oh, his name's left me, but the guy that left West Brom. Fill me Slaven Bilic. Yeah, Slaven Bilic. Slaven Bilic, sorry. Yeah, Slaven Bilic should be a decent shout, but is he just a big name on a big wage that won't do it with our squad? Is our squad even technically good enough anymore? The, that squad's four years in now. Flex four years in. Uh, Basham's five years in. Egan three. O'Connell four. Do they? Will they have that same fire in their belly to play forty-six games? Tuesday, Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday. Does it need? Does it, the team need a rebuild? Do we need to hold on to people and let certain people go that we may not want to let go because we need to freshen it up? That'd be my question, and I think Eddie Howe would be the man for that project, man. Interesting. All right, uh, Mr. Pye, before we let you go, we have such a unique playing style, the 3-5-2 overlapping centre-backs. This is even played in the academy. Do you see a formation and tactical change right throughout the club if, as we've speculated, Alan Nil and maybe Paul Heckenbottom leave? Yeah, I think anyone that's ever seen me comment on any of Johnny's videos knows I'm crying out for a formation change. It needs to go back to having a number 10 in that Duffy role. I know it's called the Duffy role, it's not really the Duffy role, but it will that always be done. the Duffy role, Mr. Yeah, Pat. it'll always it'll always be the Duffy role, same as it'll always be like the Makalele role. Um, but to, that's like to Sheffield United fans. Um it just it needed changing when we'd not won in the first ten games. As far as I were concerned, we were down after seven, like seven defeats or whatever it were, ridiculous. But it just needed it needed changing so much quicker. And the fact that it's not been changed 
at all. I mean, I know we change formation during the game, but at least start with something different, even just a basic 4-4-2. The players aren't that institutionalised where they forgot to play 4-4-2. I know we train it from like under eights up as the academy teams play 3-5-2, 3-5-2, 3-5-2, 3-5-2, 3-5-2. But surely, when you're realising that there is no link between the midfield and the strikers after five games, 10 games, 15 games, 20 games, and then all of a sudden you win a game where you've dropped a player into that 10 role and you've left all your strikers on. He did a Warnock, basically, didn't he? He put all his strikers on. And we won a game. It's no, it, it's no secret that that's the reason why we won that game. Mr. Pye, thank you so much, Paul Cormack, for uh, joining us. Really <laughs> I'm appreciate death threats now. <laughs> I've, I've given <laughs> out your, uh, name your government drop. name. <laughs> government name yeah. released. Uh, we've got to apologise as well to, uh, to Vic. We've kept him waiting for absolutely ages. But thank you, Mr. Pye. Really appreciate that. Blame Johnny E over I were I were ready and waiting of, of words with him. If in doubt, blame Johnny. I think that's what we'll do uh, for the rest of the programme. Let's welcome uh, Vic, a.k.a. Pompey. Pompey, what, what shirt is that you're wearing? That's a nice black uh, black number you've got on. It's a, it's a black training top. It's um, I've worn black because obviously because of the sombre mood that we've got descended all over the club at the moment. And also, you know, in seriousness, we want to extend a, join you in extending uh, our condolences uh, to to Phil Jagielka and uh, with a family loss. But uh, on a more kind of most most focused mood, yeah, it's a it's a training top. But uh, anyway, lads, 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 you like the shirts in the back there? Eh? You've made a much more <laughs> of an effort than I have, uh, but I've got to say, I love I love the training top, and I think we've got to start with the, the big question: What do you, Vic, make of Chris Wilder leaving the club? Well, I mean, I watched one of your your podcasts. Um, I think it was yesterday, and there was people really ready really to chuck themselves under the bus about it all and, and throw themselves in the in the sea with a lawnmower tied tied around their necks. There was a lot of grief going on, and I understand it. You know, Adam Cameron and Evie, poor Evie was almost breaking a heart over it. And I get it. I get it. But to be honest with you, to be to be contrary about it, and everybody wants me to be contrary about it, I think it was bloody inevitable. I mean, look at where we are. 29 games in, 23 losses, goal difference minus 34 and 14 points. You know, I mean, it, in, in real fairness, if this wasn't Chris Wilder, if it was Kevin Blackwell, he'd have been gone in October. You know, we, we, we've got to face the facts that we've been underperforming all, right away from the lockdown start restarting it's not been a pretty Sheffield United as it was prior to the lockdown and and you know I mean, I mean we, we can blame crowds not being in beautiful downtown Bramall Lane we can blame a host of other things I mean which are quite relevant which is the injury problems that we've had but Wilder being stubborn really is has been his own downfall you know he's, he's got a reluctance to, to to tackle the issues on the pitch really uh, right away from front to back, you know, we, we've we've really struggled to actually get some consistency and also to pass the ball effectively and retain possession. Look at our possession stats this season, they're d- dreadful. And in the Premier League, the better clubs are keeping the ball a lot longer, you know, and moving it up the pitch. And then there's the confounding issue of this, the signings, you know. I mean, this is all stuff that's kind of contributed towards him going, you know. I'm sad to see him go, I really am. I want to see him you know, first of all, go down with his ship to use a nautical tome, uh, saluting until the last gun was firing. Fantastic, great, Chris White. That's what we expect from him. Um, and at least to get into next season and tackle that and probably put us in a top six position by Christmas and at least win the playoffs uh, next season. You know how good we are at winning playoffs, you know. It's, so to me, it was, I'm sad he's gone, but I think it was inevitable. I really do. I'm, 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 I'm gutted. He was a brilliant guy, but it's, it's his innate stubbornness that's actually killed him, you know. Yeah, I just don't answer, uh, Marco. When does the stream end? I think at the rate we're going, never is uh, is possibly the uh, <laughs> the answer to that one. Do, do you want me to hurry up? <laughs> no, not at all. That's not a, that's not a dig at you. Uh, we're all we're, we're constantly having a go at Johnny. That's what we're. That's the mantra that we're now keeping. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, next season, I know it's difficult to say without knowing who's going to be in charge. But do you think we're going to bounce straight back up? Do you think some people are saying we're going to fly down the leagues like like Sunderland? What what's your thinking? I don't think so. I think we've got. I think we're, even if we sell, even if we sell, we're inevitably going to sell Burger, and I, I would imagine he would be going. He's the first one to go. Uh, O'Connell is a, is another great talent. And so he's, there's quite a lot of talent in that in that in that team. But I imagine a lot of them will stay at Bramall Lane, 
And that gives us a bit of a base from which to build. Um, you know, there are some alterations that we do need to have in the club and we do need to bring in better players. We do need to replace that midfield needs a complete clear out and we need to have a better way of, of playing football on the pitch. Um, we're not going to get an easy time next season in the championship. It always is difficult to league to, to tackle and to get some success out of. But uh, I don't think we're going to drop. I don't think we're going to. I think what Blades fans need to do, this isn't the end of the world. We lost, lost Wilder. You know, have some faith. You know, we've seen some worse, worse situations than this. We really have. And, uh, and I know it happened when we, you know, when Warnock went. And I, people are fearing that. But I just don't see that happening this time. I think, I think we've got a bit more, a bit more petrol in the tank for that. You know, I can't see it happening. I mean, the prince, the prince has got to let time for all this pressure, this, this, this anger and grief to dissipate. He's also, he's also got to de-wilderize the club. You know what I mean? It sounds a bit clinical and cruel, you know, but he's got to get Chris Wilder out of everybody's blood and focused on the new season ahead and get the playing, you know, the, the, the sort of playing mantra back into the team and also to tackle the first day of next season when that fantastic stadium is going to be stuffed full of noisy United fans. And I think that's going to really spur the players on. You know, we, we are going to... Um, I'm sorry, that's my coffee machine just emptying. But uh, yeah, it's... It, it's I, I can't see us... I can't see us... We're not finished. It's Sheffield United, you know. We're not yeah. finished. I was I was going to ask you a question, but you've, you've actually already kind of covered it there about if we've seen anything like this before. So Nick, you can jump straight to your next question, buddy. Yeah, yeah, no problem at all. Um, so, what was your standout Chris Wilder moment? Yeah, uh, I've got two. Okay, um, I'll be I'll be brief. But um, first one um, in July of 2017, we had we had a pre-season friendly up the road here at Eastleigh at uh, the Ten Acres Stadium at the Spitfires Ground, and I thought, oh, I can't miss this. This is going to be brilliant. So I drove on up there, parked up in the car park, uh, found my way through, and, and noticed I'm avoiding. The, I'm avoiding the uh, Bouncy Day Massacre and I'm avoiding Basham arriving. Right? Everybody's done that to death, but this was one one personal for me. And um, I found my way into the stadium um, and I was asking around, where's the away, away fancy? And this lad, this Irk, came up and went, yeah, all right, mate, he sits up there. So I made my way along the touchline. As I came along the touchline, I came around the side of the dugout and there stood just here, if you like, was Mr. Chris Wilder in his puffer jacket and it was just drizzling. And uh, I looked at him and he looked at me and I don't think he sort of twigged and thought, yeah, that's that, that trappy sod Pompey off uh, 24SU. Um, I don't think that happened, but we, we nodded each other, you know, a, a blades nod. And that, that, that's lived with me, that, you know, me and him shared a nod. But the second one is really special. Um, in um, May of 2019, I, uh, I booked Yonks before. We booked a, a 40th year uh, school reunion for my old school at Gleadless Valley um, in Sheffield. And I booked, me and my wife were booked into the Copthorne on May the 5th, the weekend, not knowing that that was going to be one of the most fantastic weekends that we as Sheffield United fans have ever seen. And we we did the school reunion. It was brilliant to see all my mates. Um, I went with my mate from um, Shire Green and my other mate from Willow um, to go and watch the beam back. We sat in the stadium. That was Awesome, even watching us draw 2 2 with Stoke. And then I hung about the stadium and wait for the black bus to come up Bramble Lane. And up it came. It, it stopped outside the railway. The players were inside. I was thumping on the side. There was people laying in the road. There was beer going everywhere. You could see all the players jumping about inside. Honestly, it was awesome. And then it inched its way around into Cherry Street, then into the car park and moved its way around. And for that moment, and this is special. It was like a volcano erupted. All the misery of the past 20 years just went upwards into the sky. You know, it was a kind of a, an orgasm of joy. Can I say that, orgasm? Is that, is that no, a good, good no, word? No, <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was this massive volcano of joy and elation that just went upwards mm. and upwards and upwards into the clouds. And they carried the players out and they, you know, everybody around was just hugging. And that was Chris Wilder. Chris Wilder made that. And if you're ever watching this, Chris Wilder, on behalf of every single Blades fan here, I want to thank you personally for that. That was that was magic. You know, people going about Tony Curry, you can do magic. Chris Wilder, that was definitely his moment. It was soured later on because we went back into the Copthorne and McCabe slunk, slunk his way in and some fans were singing his praises and I was like, shall I chuck some at? <laughs> 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 but, 
I, I know how you've you've got your misgivings about Mr. McCabe, and so have I. You know, it's it's the mm. way it goes. But to be honest, they, they were two standout wilder moments for me. You know, I mean that 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 particular weekend in Sheffield was just bloody marvellous. It was ace. You just oh. gave me some right goosebumps then, mate. Some me too. Right yeah. <laughs> hairs on the back of the neck. Oh, it just felt so good. Well, it, it, was, it was a really good day, wasn't it? It was a really, really good day to be a Sheffield United fan. You know, at last, everybody on planet Earth saw that badge and they started to recognise how good we are. And that's the thing about, you know, this, this club itself. We're a global brand. And I think that's what the Prince is a little bit sort of he's a bit squiffy about now is the fact that we're anchored to the bottom of the Premier League. We're, we're performing really, really poorly. Our name is now starting to drop a little bit in, in, everybody's, rec in everybody's reckoning. And, mm. you know, it matters to us, this badge. It really does, you know. And, 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 and I think it's one of your previous posts has said, you know, that's, that's what we're here for. We're here for the badge. We're not here for personal alliances. Although we've lost somebody who's really, really precious to us, you know, we've done this before. I mean, you you, you know, like when you say what we've been through, you know, since 1976 and finishing so high, getting relegated through the divisions and having all the crap from sort of um, Hashimi and Woolhouse and, and the Ched Evans affair and our names being dragged through the mud and all this really bad times, trudging out of the Millennium Stadium, having been thrashed by wolves, you know, the, the you know, We've had, I feel like chuck, chucking myself in the river Taff, you know, driving driving back through that tunnel with all the wolves fans tooting their horns. Mm. You know, I, I don't know where to put myself. We've been through worse times. We really have. This is the departure of an old family friend. And mark my words, he's not gone from Bramall Lane forever. I've oh, got really? a feeling that man's going to be back. Well, Vic, uh, you've ended on a you've ended on a high, Vic Woods, aka Pompey. We'll have to get you back on. You were. Fantastic. You were brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed. It's a pleasure. And uh, up the blades, everybody. Up the blades. Thank you. Oh, All wow. blades, aren't we? Uh, we're now going to introduce uh, Gary Hemingway, and I'm going to apologise profusely to him for uh, how long we've we've kept him waiting. Gary, how are you doing? I'm all right, buddy. How are you, boys? Are you well? Slonshire. Yes. Today <laughs> is naturally St. Patrick's Day. So uh, all the very best to you, boys. It is. It absolutely is. And... Uh, Gary, I, I don't know if I, I don't want to say it in case you, you want to keep it quiet, but you've done some stuff with the club in the past. Uh, so if you want to mention that, you've got this opportunity because you know a lot of people at work at the club and, and Chris and you've helped me with stuff. So first of all, thank you. Yeah, and if you want to choose to mention it, now you can. Cheers, cheers Hal. Hi, Nick. Um, yeah, I think, aren't we all just devastated? I think everybody's just feeling rotten at the minute. Our hero's gone. Um we're all daydreamers as Blades fans, aren't we? Reality never really ever happens, and we always just want the best to happen. And we've been in fairy tale land for the last five years. It's been amazing. I've loved it. Um, interestingly, how you and I have spent several occasions, be that a trip to Portugal from Gibraltar or, or other bits and bobs. It, there's loads of bits that have gone on. Um, listening to Vic speaking there, he came out with some really poignant parts and some great effort. Uh, on his behalf and I don't honestly know how to follow it but there is one little story I will tell you which wasn't quite planned um, but I remember going out so uh, I did the wreath laying for Armistice Day and this was uh, 2017 when for the first time in a good long set of years Wednesday we're back at our place so we're at the lane I'm just about to go out in front of the cop lay the wreath to all those mighty blades will certainly appreciate it. Dave McCarthy, Dave's a top lad, stitched me up a kipper. So he said, Gary, I didn't tell you before this because I thought you might not be too happy, son. He says, but you're laying Wednesday's reef. I said, okay, Dave, you've probably dropped me right in the clag here, but I'll live with it. Let's go with it. So uh, I'm still one side. There's a young lass stood next to me and she's uh, she's going out to see Billy and take, take her reef off down the other end. I'm going out to see Tom Lees. And as I walk, just before I walk out, uh, Dave whispers in my ear, he says, oh, by the way, I told him, told Tommy, lifelong uh, owl as well. And I went, oh, I'll accept us so much. I'll uh, pay him back to you. So bearing in mind, I'm representing, I'm representing the country because I'm in my military uniform. 
I'm walking out, I've shook hands with Tommy Lees, we're walking out down towards Wage Sand, and uh, there's all these Wednesday fans cheering, thinking, oh, there's this lifelong owl coming to greet him. So I marches up proudly to the end, and just before I get there, I tell, uh, tell Tommy Lees, by the way, Tommy, hope we get you right doing tonight. I'm a blade. <laughs> <laughs> and actually on Sky, you can see Tommy Lee's going like this. And he just looks at me as much saying, what's going on? So I get to the end, I stop, I suit, and there's a load of my mates in the bottom end, and they're like, what are you doing there? Give me dog's abuse. But it was brilliant. I turn around and walk back off from there, get back, and Dave McCarthy's like, what did you say to Tommy? What did you say to him? So I told him, um, Unless you knew what were going off, you wouldn't have known it. But yeah, there course. you go. That was that well, what that's exactly what I was alluding to. I want to take this moment to say thank you to Sam Lewis as well for being in the super chat. We really appreciate that. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Shout out to Spencer Robinson, who was in Bielefeld with Gary Hemingway. Uh, I first met Gary when I was in uh, Germany as well. So, uh, Gary, let's get straight to the questions. Did you see any of this coming with Chris Wilder leaving? Was, as some have stated, the writing on the wall? How you and I have talked offline, I've chatted with the fellas about it. I did, um, but a moment had passed equally. I thought Jan 21, it was inevitable. I thought we were going. The results didn't say we were going to stay, stay in the league. It made sense to get over it. Vic, um, Vic alluded to in the last statement very clearly that there's a period of wild grief going to go on now, and we need to get over that. <clears throat> and we need to get over it and get to the right position so that we can move the club forward. Um, I equally ally with him that I think uh, I think there'll be a second coming of the Messiah. So a second coming of the Messiah. Well, we'd, we'd like to see that. Yeah. Uh, Gary, your internet is actually not yeah, brilliant at the moment. So um, I'm just going to, we're probably going to ask you just one more question, uh, only because we're, we're losing you a little bit at the moment. But, as a company okay. CEO, you would take a deep look behind the scenes. Chris Wilder clearly did this. Do you think this is why he possibly left? And if so, what do you think he saw behind the scenes that, that worried him? I think there's been there's plenty of media speculation and there's plenty of uh, social media speculation about what's gone off at the training ground, where things are going right, where things are going wrong. Um, and all those, all those elements are certainly going to stop new, excited young players coming to the club because they're going to come and see the facilities and they're not going to be excited by it. And they're going to think, I've stepped back into the 80s, almost going back to when when Sam's type of era, um, rather than seeing the new technical uh, Sheffield. Yeah. So I think for anybody coming in and be, be that long term for us and as Chris has probably done and probably the discussion with the owners, I think that those changes have got to happen. But equally, I think one of Chris's downfalls is not accepting the director of football. Um, I think there are all times in life when we get things wrong and we don't think we've got them wrong. We have a look in a mirror and we think, yeah, yeah, 100 percent. I know I'm right. Um, and I think he's, he's been stubborn with his tactics, if I'm honest. And it hurts, hurts to say it, but it's a results business. You can't go on losing rounds um, in some form of results, you know. And that's been there for quite some time. I think if we look back at it over the last two years, um, we've, we've always struggled to get the ball in the, in the final third. Getting it in the onion bag has been even worse. Um, once you start to stop the overlap, overlapping wing backs that we've got, then actually the service dries up. So a lot of people, I'm not a massive McBurney fan, but if you don't give them service, the poor fella ain't going to score. And that equally goes for Bruce State. You can put Ronaldo up front. He ain't going to score mm. for us if you give him the ball. Spot it's on. Not, it's not just that, though, is it? It's just the fact that you're only, if you're only giving him one chance every two games, that one chance is going to be Absolutely. their chance. They need to score that goal. They don't score that one chance that we created for them. Like we don't all know how strikers are, and like they go through barren spells and stuff like that. If you're only getting one chance a game and you miss it, that's going to play on your mind as well. Absolutely. I mean, if we if we take 
this year's leading goal scorer, did he? And look at how, how everybody was on his back last year for not scoring. Actually, did he was a provider last year. Yeah. He, all of our forwards, regardless who it is this year, are all tracking, tracking back into the number 10 position, tracking things to try the ball up to make opportunities for themselves. Nobody's leaving the club to die on this one. But equally, tactically, we've got to understand what's gone wrong there because we're not getting it to them. And consequently, they can't score. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Gary, uh, we are just losing you a little bit uh, internet-wise. So thank you so much for uh, popping on the uh, the chat. We really appreciate it and for sharing. Cheers, guys. Thanks so ever so much. Yeah, pity the, pity the net's going down. It's because I'm all this way over in Ireland and we're, we're busy part party with the black stuff <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll, we'll let you enjoy st patrick's day uh gary, Thanks, gary. Anyway, thank you so so much uh nick i'd like to introduce a uh, another friend of mine uh tyrone uh we go we go way back tyrone good, I, evening. I, good evening first time i met you uh we were in london together i think we in a pub watching the blades against preston north end in these right. uh, playoff semis yeah, that's right. This very, very noisy blade behind me. And I was thinking, who is this guy? <laughs> no, yeah, it's lovely <laughs> to see you again, Hal. Really yeah. good to see you. Thank you, Tyrone. Thank you for having me on. Hal, um, I can't imagine you being so so shouty. You're so articulate. <laughs> I can't imagine game, you being... To be honest, it, it, it was, was a tense game. <laughs> Nick, you've not watched a game with me. I'm awful company to watch a football match with. Well, it sounds like we're not going to have uh, have that time to, uh, to to be at a match together then in that case. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Tyrone, right, how do you feel after you've had the time to digest this Chris Wilder news? Because it, we've had a lot of time to digest, haven't we, on that Friday when we found out a little bit of rumours. Uh, it mm. take, took such a long time to come out. So, how have you, uh, how have you found it? Well, yeah, Nick, I think in, immediately, like, devastated to be honest as as, as um, more or less every blade was um thinking about it though you know ha having a few days to digest it uh listen to you know other opinions and that sort of stuff it's 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 still very very gutting um you know we, we've we've lost the person that embodied sheffield united um and or at least it has for the last four and a half five years um so yeah it, I, I would have said you know devastated um but just listening to the other people, you know, that have been on on this evening so far, like Gary and and, and then Vic just before, um, we we we'll we'll recover. We, you know, Sheffield United um, will exist long after uh, Chris. You know, Chris Wilder's memory is it, just it's just that, it's just a memory. You know, um, it's uh, a case of I think that um, I think Chris has said it in interviews himself. You know, uh, managers, board members. You know, chairmans, they they players, they come and go, but the fans are, are always there, and, and the club will always be there. Um, you know, fingers crossed. So yeah, de mm. devastated. But but like 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 Vic said earlier, we well into the grieving process now, and and that comes in stages. So the next, you know, one of the stages will be acceptance. And I, I, although I'm not there yet, and I know probably thousands of blades aren't, uh, we, we, we'll get there. You are right. We will get there. It does feel like it might be a long time. But uh, yeah. if you had to pick a, a favourite Chris Wilder moment, Tyrone, what are you going to go with? I'm going to pick one out of left field, and I apologise. Um, I haven't seen everybody that's been on this evening. Um, I'm going to pick one that that's, that's was pretty early on in uh, Chris Wilder's time. And it was the League One promotion season. And it was, well, Hal, I know what your um, memory is like when it comes to football matches, so you'll probably be able to tell me the exact date at the time of the kickoff. Um, we played Coventry at Ramel Lane, um, and John Fleck scored. And as John Fleck scored and celebrated, he ran over to the south stand, um, over to where Chris Wilder was, and did the chest slide <laughs> in front of him. And Chris Wilder then jumped on the pitch and, and did the chest slide as well, and joined in the, in the celebrations with the fans at that moment there. You know, it, it was a really, really good season. It, it, it was a brilliant season, that altogether. But that moment there, that was a moment where I thought, actually, you know what? We've got something really, really special. Here. We've got a manager that celebrated in a way that I'd never seen a manager celebrate celebrate before. You know, we, you know, <laughs> Sheffield United score goals and the managers, you know, pump the fist and that sort of stuff. That that was that was truly the moment where I thought, you know, 
Chris Wilder, he he really is one of our own. You know, it, that, mm. that's it. He feels that he gets it. You know, he he wants to be on that pitch celebrating like all the thousands of us in, in Bramall Lane did when when John Fleck scored. Um, so so that was probably, I, I know it's probably not the, not the biggest Chris Wilder moment because there's hundreds of others I could have picked, <laughs> but that one to me was was one that literally, and I'm, I'm getting chills just thinking about it now. That that was a, a big moment for me. That yeah, yeah, another probably game I missed. Favorite. Uh, 5th of uh, 5th of April, 2017. I knew you'd know that. I knew yeah, you'd know it. I knew you'd know it. <laughs> well, Tyrone, me and you share the same Chris Wilder moment because I was uh, mentioning that earlier on. Yeah, I was saying there's not really you're not going to see many other managers doing something something as daft as that. Don't. And he, he is, yeah, such, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, yeah. So moving on to players that you yeah. could you could you see any players that could become kind of like a, a manager of a club or even manager of Sheffield United from the current crop? Do you know, it's difficult to know that, isn't it? Mm. I think being a player and being a manager are two completely different skill sets. And, and we, we know that, you know, some of the best players in the world have gone into management. It's not really worked out for them. So I think that's very, very difficult. Looking at the at, at the squad that we've got now, then, you, you know, I'd look towards the senior, more senior players in that and, you know, look at people like Jaggy Elker and Basham and, and Billy Sharp. And I think, you know, I'll speak about Billy Sharp shortly. But, um, yeah, if you look at you, there's those senior players there, you'd think that they would be the ones to sort of like rally the troops a little bit, you know, in in, in, in and around the dressing room and, you know, bringing the younger players on, on side and, and keeping them in line, that sort of thing. And, again, I, 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 it is a different skill set. So being able to, you know, being uh, adept with the football in between your feet is different to motivating someone to kick the football in the right in the right place and that sort of stuff, uh, and 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 um, uh, and all that comes with it. Um, if I look at what Billy Sharp's done, Billy Sharp's got the you know he's got the youth academies at the moment that he runs um, um, outside of the club uh, with the youngsters. So potentially maybe you know if he, if he's developing that skill set, then you know I could possibly see a, a role in some capacity maybe not Sheffield United but maybe a role in some capacity working with youngsters maybe an under 23 squad and 18 squad and I suppose because you know he is a blade and um uh, sentimental reasons I, I I I wouldn't really mind if you you know I wouldn't I wouldn't mind seeing him as, as Sheffield United boss one day assuming that he's, he's able to make that step up to management but that's purely just for sentimental reasons that's not me knowing anything about Billy Sharp or his character or anything like that it's purely because I absolutely love him, and he loves us, and and you know many of us share that share uh, share share those feelings with me. So you know that 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 those would be the, the three players that I think actually you know yeah m maybe just purely because of their senior states within the squad. Yeah, it'd be a it'd be a proper blades loving. It would, wouldn't it? You know, you've got if you look at what we've had with Wilder, and I've, I've said this to to everyone that listened over the last few days. What we've had with Chris Wilder over the last four and a half five years is unique and i don't think it's just unique to sheffield United. i think it's in a way it's unique to maybe the, the majority of football we've got you know we've got a sheffield United fan in charge of the hometown club he's taken us from you know not not, not the very bottom but he's taken us from you know we, we were in trouble in league one we were in trouble yeah. for six years but bottom for so, where i think sheffield united should be yeah absolutely yeah you, yeah yeah you know you look at historically where we've been we've, we've always been we've always been that second division championship club haven't we you know mm. for, for, uh, for, for the majority of our history, but if you look at where he brought us to, and, and to, to finish, you know, top ten of the Premier League, and and just to unify everything that he, he did in such a way and so quickly, how he did that, I, that's very very unique. I would absolutely love something like that to happen again, but it's very very unlikely that it will. And I certainly, you know, if if it does, I would hope it would be with Billy Sharp as that manager. But you know, that, um, that that's uh, that that's the ultimate dream at the moment. <laughs> Yeah. We've also spoke to Nick Montgomery as well, Nick, haven't we? He was saying he he might be interested in coming back from Australia. And, and Ben Osborne runs the, the football coaching as well. So maybe, maybe we've got a few people that could be candidates in the future. You just, you never know. I, I think them. with that, the, the thing with our, our current proper players is that Chris Wilder loved to bring in ready-made captains. And and that's what he was uh, beating, beating down on um, at Leicester away last season, wasn't it? Where's my captains? Where's my this? Where's my that? And he he obviously um, he got he's got Jack O'Connell, he's got John Egan, he's got Chris Basham. Three central defenders are going to play every single game. Could all be captains. Then you've got Norwood. Then you've got Billy Sharp. You've got 
an abundance of captains there. So yeah. I think there could be many, many uh, managers in, in the current crop. Yeah, there could be. It's what, it's what Glenn Hoddle did um, with England at Euro 96. You know, he put together a squad that, that were full of captain materials, full of leaders on the pitch, That, that you know, and, and, and it almost worked out. <laughs> almost. So, uh, Tyrone, almost. final... Final question yeah. for you, my friend. Uh, if fans are back next season, and we don't really want to think about this, but if we do start poorly, do you think the atmosphere will actually turn toxic at Bramall Lane? Or do you think that fans will actually have had time to process what's gone on and think, well, realistically, that's not going to help anything? Yeah, I certainly hope not. You know, I've, I've been to Bramall Lane when it's been toxic, and I think it's counterproductive to everything that, that we're trying to do. You know, and, and it's that there's a right... The, well, Bramall Lane can be intimidating for the right reasons, and I think that's that's very very different to where it's toxic and you know it's it's aimed at managers, it's aimed at players. I've I've been there when it's been aimed at the board, that sort of stuff. It's just not a very nice, not a very nice um, atmosphere or experience. So I'd certainly hope not. Uh, I know Vic alluded to it earlier. Um, I think we do need this time to process. I think that the the Prince and, and and the board now they've got an opportunity now in the next few months to tell us. Or at least to show us then, if, if they can't tell us, show us what what the plan's going to be moving forward. Because I do feel like that's you know that that's a bit of a risk for us at the minute. We've we've lost Chris Wilder and and everything that he brought with with him to the club, uh, the philosophy and that sort of stuff. So I think we're a little bit um, of um, we're a little bit at all all at sea at the moment. So I think that the prince has got a few months now ahead of the new season to get somebody uh, a, a new manager in place. Um, and I think that that new manager will, uh, as always, they'll they'll receive the full support uh, of, of myself and other both thousands of other players right from the very mm. start. I, I don't think you know if we've got if we have a new manager in place by then, and I, I certainly expect that we would have, then that's really not going to be a great um, a great environment for them to to, to actually try and get some results. And if if we do start Paula, um, I, I wouldn't. Really, I, I think it's a little bit unknown at the moment how we're going to start, and and I just think there's going to be that much change and transition over the next few months ahead of the new season i don't think that anyone really knows what to expect i certainly hope not that, that it's not not toxic because again i just as i said i don't think it helps anybody and it's um, yeah it, it's counterproductive terry makes a really good ahead. point yeah terry hatter says uh, let's make the lane the most difficult place for opposition teams to come not for our own team and that is absolutely the way that i am thinking about it terry spot on and you know tyron i don't think we've ever had a foreign manager. There's been a few people in the comments stating that the Prince might bring in someone from overseas to be our manager. I might be wrong. Maybe someone could correct me in the comments, but I'm pretty sure Sheffield United have never had a, uh, a foreign manager. So I'm just going, hmm. Certainly not in my life. I know. Um, <laughs> no. I, I, I listened to um, I listened to Four Blades in the pub earlier, uh, their, pod, their podcast, and um, they, they came up with the same the same analogy. They, they, they couldn't name uh, a foreign manager that we'd had. Um might be something it was something as soon as i heard about you know um while, while they're leaving and i thought mm. you know you, you obviously think well who's next then? and i looked at the list of the the next uh, manager odds and and after i'd um you know uh, clean my eyes out with bleach <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I, I was thinking well actually they might you, you might go abroad you know with 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 the manager there i'm not 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 quite sure who who that would be but yeah i don't think we've ever had one have we i, I certainly can't think of any uh how many Steven. people are currently Googling that right now? <laughs> yeah, well, in a sense, could be quite... Because I was, like I said, I listened to the four uh, in a pub earlier, and that was something that I thought, oh, actually, because um, I, I was out at the time, I thought, actually, I'll, I'll Google that when I get home, but I, I forgot. So, Danny yeah, Begara. Stephen says Danny Begara, who was, I think, caretaker uh, for a right. spell. So we've got David Weir, Scotland. We've got Wales. Yeah. We've got uh, Northern Ireland in Danny Wilson. But other than that, for, for permanent yeah. managers... Nobody. Uh, good show. Some amusing comments coming in. Uh, Tyrone, really appreciate this. I've been much less Larry than when we first met, and I'm sure that's... <laughs> always nice you. to speak to you. Huh? Yeah, always nice to speak to you, mate. Benefit with your ears, with your headphones, and it would be even louder. Uh, but thank you <laughs> so much. We'll hopefully get you on thank the you. channel again. Cheers. Thanks. Thanks, Hal. Thanks. Thank, thank you for having me. Cheers. Up the yeah, blades. Right. Up, Up the blades. blades. Before Up we continue blades. and uh, lose any more for being on, on so long... Can you please make sure you like the stream? That would be amazing. We don't have as many as I, I would like. So if you could go over, like it, subscribe, you know what to do. Uh, it really, really helps us get out to, to more people, doesn't it, Al? It does. Well said, sort of. 
So we've got our uh, our final guest, and then I can have a pee. Uh, we've got Cameron, Cameron Lambert. Uh, Cameron! <laughs> oh, look, at, look at this, you've invested in lighting since we last oh, spoke. It's that fiver I got sent, I've upgraded. <laughs> Is this the same room? No, no, a different room. We've moved, we've moved from the Chilean mine, as I like to call it. Oh, someone's got two rooms in the house. Someone's yeah. doing well. Uh, <laughs> By the way, uh, we've hardly had any super chat today, so uh, let's try and sort that out. Give us and, some uh, money. Give us some yeah. money. <laughs> I we need more light. light. <laughs> do, do it for Cameron's illumination, if nothing else. Uh, so, Cameron, training facilities, academy structure, club finances and foundations for the club to survive. How confident are you that these are in safe hands going forward? Oh, I don't know about safe hands. Um to be honest, from, well, I, I actually had a look at it today. Um, I think it was in the 24th, 25th of July, 2020. Um, an article was on the Sheffield United uh, website about improving the training facilities. Um, so they were going to invest in putting, I think, you know, state-of-the-art sort of heat and altitude training chambers, new changing facilities, um, enhanced medical and kit management, stuff like that, really. Um but then, from what I've been told, the reality is the roof's caved in, it's leaking, and there's only one training pitch to train on, which has come out. And, uh, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't seem very positive, really. And that's come out from, obviously, Wilder leaving and everything. And um, when I look at it on pictures and things like that, I used to go to the Tony Curry um, summer camp when I was a kid. I don't know if any of you two went to that, but yeah, yeah. Um, used to go to that. And it doesn't look like it's changed since then. And that were at least, for what? 15 years ago it doesn't it doesn't look any different so i can see you know where the points what wild has made if, if it's true that the training ground hasn't changed and things like that and especially from that article what's on the website there's there's been none of that implemented so it is kind of worrying that that's never happened when we've been in the premier league you know for two years um but i'm not sure if he's got the well, I, I'm pretty sure he hasn't got enough money to, you know, look after things like that. But I guess with having the lowest wage bill in the Premier League going down and not losing players, it shouldn't really be an issue with that. So I guess in safe hands, I don't know, I wouldn't say it's safe, but it's OK for the championship, I guess. It's, it's been well documented that uh, Chris Wilder wanted uh, a, a piece of land next to Shirecliff for, uh, to add another pitch to that. And uh, it was going to cost about a million pounds, and it, it sounds like they they agreed to that, and then it never happened. So I think yeah. I think that's happened a, a few times with the training ground since Chris Wilder's been the manager. So, and then I think awesome. Nick, the frustration comes in when we, and I guess Wilder would have been then also hearing about the purchase of a of a French club and another club added to the United World, and he's thinking, well, surely maybe that that money could have been spent on what we desperately need, and we've got three teams training on one pitch. Oh yeah, yeah. definitely. Okay. I, I, I used to um, I used to play football for University of Derby, and our home game our home games were played at the Derby County's training ground. Um, and you go there, and there's probably well, there's at least six, seven, eight pitches what are all like Bramwell Lane, <laughs> and it's just like you go to Shirecliff and you think, well, it's like you might as well go down to Warminster Road and train down there. It's not, not that it's much different. Warminster Road's better. <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's not that much different. So, um, yeah, I can completely understand the frustration, especially as a Premier League club. I mean, you look at Leicester, what they've just done. I know they're an established Premier League club, but we want to, as while they want to aspire and be like a, an established Premier League club. So you look at things like that and it, it must be frustrating as a manager. It really must. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's possibly one of the straws that brought the camels back. Um what was your favourite lasting Chris Wilder memory then, Cameron? Oh, I've got a few. He has been in my uh, local pub a few times and had a few pints with my dad. I did enjoy them moments um, when he was in there. Um, but for me, I'd probably say, um, it's actually a clip of it, a little short clip, but he was. Um, it was the day we went up from League One and um, he walks just by Lynn's Pantry, you know, where Taylor Taylor Barbers is. And all the fans are just stood outside there and he points over with his medal on and just because he did i did it for you and it that is that was my favorite moment when he's shouting i did it for you fans you just know you've got a one-of-a-kind manager because 
it just gave me goosebumps. And I've seen it back this week actually on Twitter, and it was just you just think, wow, what a guy, what a legend. Like, get him back. <laughs> <laughs> don't, I think, don't. I think we're about to cry. Yeah, we're at that acceptance stage now. Let's not go back in time. Yeah, well, yeah. well said, Nick. Uh, so, Cameron, what would you like to say to Chris Wilder if he was watching now? Oh, he's definitely watching now, and he? it's got to be. Um, I just want to say thank what you, Chris you Wilder. For this moment right now for Cameron to be on. That's oh, yeah, exactly. Doing. That's it. Yeah, he's seen my tweets. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just want to say thanks, Chris Wilder, for everything you've done for the football club. You've obviously united the club from being, you know, an absolute disaster with Lee, in League One with Adkins, and he's made the club a, a happy place. It was a happy place. I'd like to think it hopefully still is a happy place when we go back to Bramall Lane. Um, and hopefully one day, yeah, he can come back and he'll be back in that dugout and hopefully, like uh, Nick says, he'll be sliding on his stomach again, cock bound. <laughs> you, you never know. You never know. Weird things have happened. It happened with Eddie Howe, didn't it? He went off to uh, bigger bigger and better things and then he was back and then he took them back to the Premier League. Well, to the Premier League. So, yeah, fingers crossed. You never know. Um, and and final, final question for you, Cameron. Uh, who would you like to see as the next manager? Oh, I've thought about this and I can't really think of a you know a definite answer I'd like, but I guess with what the names that have been flying around and things like that, I actually said it to my dad. It's it's not been mentioned at all, but I wouldn't mind Martin O'Neill. Oh my my <laughs> mate my mate's a big Forest fan and he would be screwing right now. Is this the really? same Martin O'Neill who didn't rate Gary Cahill and thought Zach Knight and Curtis Davis were better defenders? Could quite possibly be that guy, yeah. But I thought I thought he did all right at Villa myself, and I just think, who do you get? I don't I don't know anyone who's probably, you know, who's free, who's going to do anything. I don't want Wagner, who's been flying about because he's doing he did terrible, didn't he, at Schalke? Um, I don't want Lennon. Lennon's been at Hibs. That's my second team. He's shocking, and obviously he didn't do well at Celtic the set well this season. Um, I don't. I don't want Tyndall. He's awful. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't really know. Who do you guys want? Oh, uh, I, you ask I, it now. I would like um, Flynn at uh, Newport County. Ryan Flynn. That, no, I think that. Uh, I think if you just actually look at what he's done there and sort of taken them from the brink. This is Michael Flynn. I'm talking about the brink of being relegated to the non-league and absolutely transforming that club on less than no budget. If he can do it with no budget and the way that he motivates his players, what could he do with budget? I worry about these managers, though, because I think these are, it's sort of like Wilder. Can he do it at another club, you know, at another level, what he did with us? And it's the same with these guys. They do it for certain clubs, and I don't think it can be replicated in other teams. So I, that sort of thing worries me a bit. But that's just my opinion, obviously. You you obviously think different. but Yep, Michael Flynn would, would, would be a brilliant shout. And... Uh... And put, it, put in the comments what you think about that, by the way. If you've had a look at Newport County now they've got on, I'm sure you all know he's done wonders. Do you, do you think Flynn is another Chris Wilder then now? Yes, I think he's the next. He's the closest I could find when I was... I knew this question was going to come at me. He's the closest I can find to the next Chris Wilder. OK, he's not a Sheffield man, but uh, he would very quickly get to grips with the, the city and the club, and it's a better place to live than Newport. <laughs> uh, one last question. Um, you know... To anyone, really, to, to anyone and everyone. Um, you know, when we went up the first time with Warnock, it didn't seem like he was trusted with money. Yeah. Um, do you think Chris Wilder wasn't really trusted with the money? I know he, he did spend big on a few players, but do you think we need somebody that needs to be, like, have, have, a, have a record of, of spending big money and, uh, and getting results? So, I guess when you look at managers who bring in you know big names they've been, they've either been at big clubs as a player or they've been at big clubs as a manager so they get them in on loans or they've got that relationship there with the players i don't know if there's any managers you know when you look at chris wilder i don't think he's even got he's had any relationship with you know players who've played for top six clubs or anything like that so i think it's probably it's not that he's not been trusted with money i think it's just that he can't get these players over the line i mean you look I guess when you think about it, you look at things like the training ground and things like that. You, you look at Lingard. Would he want to come to us or West Ham? They've got a state of an art, state of the art stadium, and they've probably got that in the training grounds as well. So it's things like that I think also add into it. So I don't, don't know if it's necessarily he's been trusted with money. 
because he's obviously been given at least 100, was it 150 odd million we've spent over two years. So he's been trusted with a, a decent whack. So, um, well, more than any other manager before him. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't even think we had that when Warnock were in charge and we were at Premier League. So, I mean, James B were four million quid, weren't he? So that's 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 sort of that with the market, I guess. He was probably like twenty five million if I guess he were now. But we yeah. thought that was mental at the time as well, four million. But we were in the Championship at the time, I suppose. Well, yeah. really, it was like a it was like a swap deal because we got four million for Jags from Everton, and then we bought BT for four million from Everton. <laughs> yeah. we, we got Gary Gary Naismith as well, didn't we? Was that part of the same deal? Wizard. I think it was part of the Jags deal, maybe, oh. or, or or in that time anyway. The same transfer window. I'm well, sure. they had they had our pants down then because I thought Naismith was terrible. <laughs> yeah, he weren't great, were it? But yeah, on to, to your question, I think Wilder has been trusted with money. I just don't think he's got the capability to bring in world or top class players because that's just not how it. I don't necessarily know if he can manage him either. He's, he seems to get better outcomes out of players from League One and Championship and making them into these Premier League players. So, What's your, what's your guys' opinions on, on that? Go on, help. No, go on, Nick. I answered the manager question, so you can have this <laughs> one. Uh, I think I might have um, worded my question wrong. I think it's more, can he, can he buy those players rather than being trusted with the money? Because it seems like he, can, he, he only trusts himself with uh, lower league players, if you like. So when we were going into the championship, he was buying League One players, uh, even League Two players, you could say, with Ender Stevens. Um, but obviously, this time he's looking at championship players, or most of them have been championship players coming up there. Maybe it is. Maybe you're right. Maybe it's the fact that he, he doesn't want kind of prima donnas um, at his club, which I can understand. But at the same time, if you want to be a top top manager, you've got to be able to. Um, to manage these players, manage these and players. And also, uh, overseas players, you know, we know that for some reason, Chris didn't want to sometimes take options that were offered to him from abroad. And we heard a few rumours about some really good players that were potentially offered to him. Mm. And you do wonder why why he didn't take those. I'll yeah, tell you what yeah. is a good positive from Wilder, though, with his transfers. Obviously, with well, if it's Wilder or the Prince, with them being on low wages, obviously, when we go down, we probably won't hold on to Sander Burge, I don't think. But... The rest, I think, we can hold on to. And I think, obviously, a lot of clubs, if you look at Fulham when they came down, they were actually struggling quite a bit with the wages and things like that because they'd spent so much when they first went up. Luckily, we're not in that situation. So I think when we do, obviously, go down and next season start playing again in the Championship, we've got players like Luke Freeman to come back off loan. Bruce is obviously going to be, hopefully, firing on all cylinders. McBurney did all right in the championship for Swansea. So you would like to think as well, we'd be financially stable for at least another year anyway. And obviously with parachute payments, we should be in a good good place really to bounce back. But it depends, I guess, on what manager we're getting and how, they, how the lads perform. Yeah, absolutely. As a last question, Cameron, what I'd like to ask is next season, um, yes. who would you want to see playing from players right now? Ooh, so I think my front two would be a rotation between Brewster. I'd have to start Brewster just because we've paid that much money for him and he needs to start scoring goals. So I'd give him at least 10 games. Um, so I'd start Brewster with probably McBurney or Burke. I'd love to see Burke in the championship because I watched the uh, the Pigs game against uh, Norwich when Campwell bent one in at night, well, late on and won that game for Norwich. And uh, I thought Burke in, in the championship, as, 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 he's physical, as he physically is, he should... Bully there, bully defenders in that league. So I'd like to see Burke and Brewster probably, um, and hopefully we can keep Fleck, um, Norwood. I'd want well my Didsy in midfield, and then yeah. obviously I'd like Bogle, and I'd love to see maybe Reese Norrington Davis back in with us, um, and then obviously the three would have to be the Pistons, Egan, Basham, and O'Connell. Yeah, I don't think any of them are going unless we get offered silly money. I don't think there's going to be wholesale uh, sales. Wholesale sales doesn't sound quite right, so I stop myself. It's also a shame that we never signed Frank Rebri. I've noticed his name in the comments because if we had signed Frank Rebri, I could have snuck onto the pitch at any time. And, well, my uh, mate actually, Johnny looks a bit like Frank Rebri. Actually, you're in for a uh, in for an in for a bit of uh, competition. A Rebri off. A Rebri off. A Rebri off. We'll, have a Rebri off. <laughs> a Rebri off. We'll, get, we'll get him on next time. We'll see who looks more like uh, Frank Rebri. Who. I'm not sure it's a great thing being compared with him because the man did have a, a serious accident involving his face. Um, so 
<laughs> not necessarily. Uh, for that comment. <laughs> not, not, not the best comparison. Uh, Cameron Lambert, as ever, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. No worries, lads. It's always a pleasure. Thanks a lot. See you soon, Cameron. Some great guests Bye, tonight, Nick, and uh, <laughs> some, some really interesting insights. Uh, I would just say, please like and subscribe. That is our final guest that we're getting on tonight. Tell one other person about the Chef United way tomorrow. Do that as a favour to us, the whole tell a friend scheme, so that we can get more subscribers. Yeah, we're coming towards 12,000 as well, Hal. I think we're coming up to 12,800, so... We're getting really, really close. It's looking about 500 subscribers a month at the moment, which is incredible. We're loving life. We're, we're putting everything into this channel as well, aren't we, Hal? People don't see the uh, probably more the effort from you. You've absolutely smashed it in recent times, especially with the social media. Same with Bobby in the background. So can we have in the comments right now, Respect for Bobby in the background. <laughs> uh, thank you, Nick. That's really kind of you to say. Thanks to all of you that have joined us. Thanks to all of you that have shared your thoughts in the comments. Nick, is there anything that you would like to leave us with before we say goodbye? Because that is it officially from me. Yeah, I would like to say I think it's time to close the chapter on Chris Wilder, even though we don't want to. Um, it's been an amazing ride that we've had with Chris. Two amazing promotions. Um, we, we love the guy to bits. We really, really do. And we I was listening to Johnny's video and we thought that um it was it was gonna be the England job that we we're gonna lose him to. And um it's obviously not. We thought we'd have him for quite a while and then eventually we would lose him to a bigger club and it looks like it, it's not happened. Um it, it's it's really tragic, but we need to move on. It's time to move on. And I'm loving the fact that everybody's going mad for Bobby in the uh, in the comments. Me too. Um but yeah, time to move on. Let's support the lads. Let's get behind the team. None of this. Uh, oh, I'm not watching this game. Uh, I think we're all at that stage where we're going through our grieving process. And as soon as we can get to acceptance, uh, the better. I yeah, think. and can I can I actually just reiterate? I've seen now abuse being sent on social media to Jan van Winkle. I've already seen it to the Prince. Please, please, we implore you to stop. That will not help anything. If anything, it will make the situation only go one way and that is not for the better these people are here to stay uh, so as much as we all love chris wilder as nick quite rightly says we do have to and it's painful but we have to move on and we will never get anyone quite like chris again who was one of us who spoke for us who said things that you'll just never get another manager say he was just fantastic he made us laugh he made us cry he was everything to sheffield united football club that's gone we didn't want it to end like this but it has. So please now, no abuse. I cannot stress that enough to our, to all our mainstays who've stayed at the club because it just won't help anything. And we all want the same thing, success for Sheffield United Football Club. Yeah. So that's it. Chapter closed. Let's leave it there. Thank you, every guest, for being on tonight. We've had, that's two fans forums where we've had every guest being brilliant. We love it. We love it. And it means me and Hal don't have to talk as much. So, uh, that's also great because I think sometimes people would uh, maybe rather us talk less. We talk quite a lot on this channel, uh, especially on the watch-alongs. We have to talk for a very, very long time. So it's nice to have other blades on the channel. Um, it really is with a few different opinions because obviously me and Hal have quite a few of the same opinions. Um, so it's good to get different blades on with different opinions. So I think we'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Hal, for being here. As always, you've been absolutely brilliant. We will let everybody else have a, a really nice evening and uh yeah here's to the next one thank you very much guys and um see you next time <laughs>